Where is a so living? I know because I'm saying I yeah. just picture where the second house. Oh. Okay. I live in uh right across from Amherst Medical. I live on the Amherst Belfast Town Line right oh, now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Watch on road. I'm right before the dump. But it's not the dump anymore. <laughs> and I wish I'd have known I was gonna be a TV. I would have wore a different shirt yeah, and a little more dressed up. But my hair would not be looking like this. <laughs> I do have on a shirt that represents the students of oh, English Regional High School in their quest to end cancer. Well that's so good. That? That's good. I almost wear my uh, other cancer shirt, but how you just came out here with the girls? You had a little bit of 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 Oh, you know, yeah, I got um, more of that, so it was definitely a lot better. Right? Oh, I know, but then you don't have one. Not the one um, the semester I got it, I got it for the Okay. Um, okay. The time is okay. Um, the time is nine ten in the morning on Sunday, October eighth. Um, I'm calling the meeting to order pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. 
No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. During the public comment period, the chair will recognize the chairs will recognize members of the public. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, preferred pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair, based upon the number of people who wish to speak. No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The HRC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during the public comment. Thank you. So do, do we need to do a roll call? Um, I don't have the list. So my microphone is on, but only if I keep my finger pressed on the button. Deborah, would you like to um, note Laverne starting this way? Just say who you are and that you're present, please. Laverne, Laverne Kelly, present. Deborah Kalagni, present. Elizabeth Haygood, present. Ronnie Parker, present. Rizwana Khan, present. Tyler Matsuo, present. Also present are Jennifer Moyston and Pamela Young. And absent right now are Asa, Joy, and Jacinta. So shall we begin? Um, is there any public comment? There is no one else in the room, so no public comment. Shall we move on then? Well, good morning, everybody. So uh, we're here to hold the HRC retreat. And the first item under the action and discussion items is introductions. And that is to include an uh, activity for you to have an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better. So in your packet is an I am poem form. Um, if you'll take, you know, um, you know, five or six minutes to uh, complete that form, then we will, that will be the first activity.
There is a person in the. Oh, we have two participants. I thought I saw one with their hands raised, but they're not.
you know, just check in. Does do people need a minute more or or? This was not easy. I'm still confused, so I don't have everything filled out yet. And I'm hoping when people read theirs, I will jog something for me. Right, so are we ready to begin? So the uh, purpose uh, of you writing an I am poem is to give you each the opportunity to share a little bit about your um, your family, your values that come through, through the prompts in the poem. And it's used, uh, I would say, in lots of different contexts, uh, often at the beginning of schools as, as students are gathering with new teachers and new classrooms. And um, the purpose ultimately is to make the group a stronger group by creating bonds am uh, among you. Uh, which I think will happen as you see similarities in your responses as well as uh, connection points. So um, if someone's willing to, to go first, they can do that, or I can model for you by, by going first. So I'm, I'm seeing hand, hands saying that I should model. So uh, where I'm from, I am from my maternal grandmother's china cabinet filled with cakes, from the red wagon that ensured my mother was named Airy. I'm from two wrongs do not make a right and a small yellow salt buck home with a jungle gym. I'm from my grandmother's flowers, peonies and azaleas, whose color and scent remind me of unconditional love. I'm from the music in my grandmother's cafe and the aprons around their waist. I'm from Richards and Leonard's, Kirby's and Nolan's. I'm from gardeners and bakers. I'm from parties and generous hospitality. From church on Sundays and Wednesday evenings. I'm from the old rugged cross. I'm from Rosie Kirby and Artemis Fletcher from pound cake and sweet potato pie, from Rosie Kirby, a survivor of slavery, and Margaret Blythers, sold into slavery and separated from a son, from the log cabin bank given to me by my grandfather that sits next to my bed. I am from those moments. I garner wisdom, strength, faith, compassion, hospitality, and hope. Beautiful. So I have had the advantage of doing this many times, but and um and of uh starting it and then coming back to it because I did take a look at it yesterday, filled in some of the blanks and was unsure about what to do from the others, and then having a second opportunity. So 
I would suggest at some point for your own benefit it is that, you know, we can give you another blank copy and that you do it for, you know, again, for yourself, because it can be really powerful just to go back to all of those references. So um, there are, are no right and wrongs. Each voice will be uh, strong. So whomever would like to begin should do so. So with some of the mics, uh, they will stay on. With others, you have to continue to hold the green. Yes, it is. All right. So mine's a bit different where I'm from. I'm from Mysore, India. Can I have to use the mic? <clears throat> I am from where I'm from. I'm from Mysore, India, where the king had local power to resolve conflicts. I'm from a home with lots of people all around and lots of children. I'm from a beautiful rose garden where children were not allowed, but we went there anyway. I'm from dance, glittery dance outfits from Ponuswami and Parker. I'm from bold, strong, and smart women, and from a supportive family. I'm from women ma who managed the household and all our lives. I'm from Sunday games organized by my church, from women who had, from a woman, an ancestor, from a grandmother who had 13 children and eight lived to adulthood. I'm from dosas and idlis. I'm from a passing grandfather, leaving my grandmother pregnant with her 13th child. I'm from poverty, loss of land and home, resulting from my grandfather's death. I'm from a combination of tight family of women, supportive, smart, and the Church of South India. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, I think going next. Just some of them. All right. Hi. I'm from Lahore and the tree trolleys from jewelry, my books of romance and clothes, fancy clothes. I'm from big, uh, um, uh, I'm from big homes surrounded with grounds, edged with flowers and mango trees of alici and persimmons. I'm from the flowers. <laughs> I'm from uh, big French windows with fresh air breeze circulating, whose flowers uh, outside in the spring greeted me on my birthday. I'm from my paintings and my TV that was large, and from Zaman and Khan. I'm from athletic and loud, and from angry, Laughter, bipolar, from males. I am from prayer rugs and scarves. Assalamu alaikum, inshallahs. I am from patans and jalandar bastis, from ice cream, mangoes, and bhindi, from Muhammad Zaman, and from bureaucrats, postmaster general, collecting make believe money and digging from, for aliens below the earth. I am from those moments. Person, um, I'm from those moments with um, access to privilege that made me evolve. All right, I guess I can go next. Um, I am from steam radiators, from desktop computers and library books, from white snowy sidewalks and urban community. I am from rabbits under the deck who are always underfoot. I am from chemistry exam uh, from Walters and Matsuo. I am from traveling endlessly and overthinking everything. And from constant writing, from dinner table discussions. I am from Christmases. I am from Danish migrants to Australia and Japanese fishermen. From miso soup and fish, 
from Intercontinental Oceanic Age of Sail Voyages and from Intercontinental 20th Century Air Voyages. I am from University of Minnesota Faculty Halls, and I am from those moments visiting family around the world. I'm happy to go next. <clears throat> I am from a forsythia bush that bloomed every spring, from tennis rackets and basketballs. I am from a corner house across from the high school where my immigrant grandparents lived upstairs. I'm from the beach whose ocean is in my veins. I am from a guitar and a baritone sax, from Kolodny and Smith, which is not a real name, but one foisted upon us at Ellis Island. I am from makers of good trouble and makers of amazing jazz and from workaholism and speaking truth to power. I am from love your neighbor as yourself. I am from Jack and Lily Smith, but really Smolovich. From chopped liver, a recipe passed down from generations and brand new recipes cut from the newspaper. From Jack Smith fleeing home at 14 on foot from Russia through Europe, boarding a boat to Mexico, walking to Guadalajara to live with his brother for a few years, and then walking to the United States to live undocumented for decades. And from Harry Kolodny watching the Cossacks kill four of his siblings at his childhood home. I'm a, I am from careening down the rapids on a camping trip I am from these moments and from generations of trauma and resilience and the dreams of my ancestors. And in this moment, all of me is broken hearted from what is happening in Israel, Palestine. <clears throat> okay, I'll go. <clears throat> okay, um, I am from television in the living room with no cable from playing music on the record player in clogs. <clears throat> I am from the house in the middle and cozy. I am from African violets who's, doesn't fit, but who's sassy. And I am from journal and Walkman, from kind and caring. From Johnson and Brown, I am from kind, like different, kind and caring, and from spiritual, from adventurous. I am from Sunday school at Goodman Amy Zion. I am from Phyllis and Adela, <clears throat> from macaroni and cheese, and a dish called Al Capone. <clears throat> from, uh, uh, from Nova Scotia in Alabama to Massachusetts and from uh, blank uh, legal vision video games. And I am from these moments guided by Johnson and Brown. I am from a deck of cards when shuffle makes a pretty picture. I am from Totola, St. Thomas, and the South. I am from a blended family with my mom, her two sisters, her best friend, and all of the kids. I am from laughter and folks all around. I am from a concrete structure where we struggle during racial tension. I am from a bowling ball and running shoes. I am from Skelton Todman's and Robert Fraser Scales. I am from family reunions and cookouts and from clam bakes. I am from a family who prays together and stays together. I am from Goodwin Memorial AME Zion Church. I am from Maddie, Virginia and James Alfred and from chickens and ham as those were my grandparents' mainstays. I am from a dad who never went to college but worked very hard and a mom who finished college at the top of her class and from a mom who died way too soon. I am from the moments who taught me how to love unconditionally. I don't think that mine is completely finished, but I'll go with what I have. 
So I'm from Bleeding Heart Flowers, from Rotary Phones and Walkmans. I am from a place that defines community and where it takes a village to raise a child. I am the woods. I am from the woods whose trees became forts and streams were hopped over from rock to rock. I am from roller skates and merry-go-rounds, from Walker family to the Moiston family. I am from love and laughter and where all the neighborhood kids were cousins. I am from adoption. I am from a Catholic church that did not accept me. And then I skipped down to like, I am from collard greens and pies and an old black woman with silver purple hair sitting on porches. Um, thank you, everyone. So uh, during lunch, we'll have another opportunity to do uh, an exercise to get to know each other. We have a bingo um, card that we'll share. Um, so uh, I can continue um, on with the agenda or I can turn it over to the co-chairs to, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to think about how you wanted to go through the rest of the agenda. I'm personally okay with following the agenda as is. Um, so if you want to just lead with the bylaw review. Okay. So next on the agenda is the bylaw review. Um, and in your packet, you have a, a, a document that um, includes language of the current uh, bylaw as well as the proposed changes. So um, I think it might be wise to just give you a few minutes to, to review those documents and then we can um, enter into discussion. So uh, the, the chart looks like this. So, uh, so before we do that, or while we're doing that, I'm just curious, I'm, before we do that, I'm just curious whether the, um, Town manager has looked at this and what his response has been. So I, I have not yet received um, any additional updates from whether the the document has gone on to legal.
excuse me. Can I, I have a question. Can I ask you that? Yes. Basically, uh, right now that uh, what we are looking at over here, that is the charter and the modifications that we need to do. So this has been uh, in the process for um, a few, uh, for, uh, I guess, uh, for some time, I guess, uh, because I just uh, entered this commission uh, yeah. last month. So Tyler and Ronnie and um, Pamela all worked okay. diligently to make oh, proposed wonderful. changes. And I been with the town manager, which it then needs to go to legal and then come okay. back. Okay. Okay. Now, adopted. this gives me a good context as to the situation right now. All right. Thanks. folks need a few more minutes or are you actually i'm done okay. thanks i'm all set if we're all ready how we do so i was just gonna wait for tyler to get back to his seat and then um I think we can, I'll do just a little bit of an overview about the process, how we got to the um, the revised vision, and then you can ask additional questions. So last year at the HRC retreat, the commission decided that they wanted to undertake a review of the existing HRC bylaws. And um, Philip, Ronnie, and Tyler, and I think at one point, um, Ben Harrington worked on looking at the existing bylaws and making suggestions. At the end of the process, it was primarily Philip, Ronnie, and Tyler who were making um, final suggestions for the proposed changes to the to the bylaw. Um, the way in which uh, a bylaw amendment occurs in town requires that the commission um, make a recommendation for changes to the town manager who then has the authority to accept or not accept or send them on for a comment. Um, at this point, the, um, the bylaws, I believe, were sent to the town manager, I want to say, May or June? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was May or June, but it, it might have it might have been later. And we are waiting to hear back from the town manager about uh, a response to the recommendation. So I think I think that uh, it was sent to the town manager May, June, like they mentioned before I came on the commission. But because it had been sitting and nothing had been done, we decided to give it a second go. And so we revised it again and gave it to the town manager in July. Since it wasn't going anywhere, we did a further revision. Um, I think that we really sort of need from the town manager an answer about when he's going to answer. So the... Um... The last conversation I had with the town manager, so he got the final revision from the commission and he requested that I create the chart that's before you. So it, that has the original bylaw side by side with the proposed changes. 
So um, we're at the you know we're at a position where we're where we're waiting to for his response. But it's also because we haven't gotten a response. If there are uh, additional changes or suggestions, um, then this is an opportunity to to make further changes. So I have a lot of questions, and can I just like jump into them? <laughs> um, first of all, I have a big question, which is what is the town manager who is a hired person get to have the power to negate the work of a committee? Like uh, structurally, procedurally, that makes no sense to me. And I'm not, I'm just gonna lay out all my questions. I don't actually expect answers to that one. Um, okay. <laughs> um, the next question I have is the the definition and the proposed change for 3.3 um, are totally different. Gender, the first, the existing bylaws about gender identity and the definitions is a much more broad reaching paragraph. And I don't understand, um, yeah, how you, was there, they're just not uh, parallel. So was there no language with this broad reaching these broad reaching demographics? So I actually think you're probably pointing out um, an inconsistency. I think the, the goal of the review committee in HRC was to change language and for it to be consistent throughout, but it went back and forth through several different edits and that's probably a miss. So if you'll flag where you, where you think that there's inconsistency of language, um, th there was a lot of time spent on the def the first paragraph definition, and that is the definition that I, I think that the HRC wanted um, to see consistently throughout. Um, and I will, in, in some ways, I hate that we're doing this before we get to the charge. I actually, that was probably an error on our part, but um, in response to your first question, uh, the, the board by... Um, town charter and by bylaw is advisory. So it there are only, to my understanding, I think one or two boards that have more authority to like direct the actions of the of the of the town. Every all of the other boards actually serve in an advisory capacity. Yeah, so it would make sense to me that the town council has the authority to review our charter and our bylaws and give final decision making, but it doesn't make sense that the town manager who's hired by the town council has that authority. Um, just in terms of like basic standard governance design, that doesn't make sense to me. But, you know, I, I don't I don't know where the place is to address that. I would just say that in the proposed changes between uh, the very first one, they're, they're not parallel. And um, it doesn't seem like the proposed change, quote unquote, should replace the definition of gender identity. It seems like it, it just there should be a, gen, a definition of gender identity. So that that was the only one I saw that didn't make sense to me in terms of lack of parallelism. Um, in general, I will just say that reading through the proposed changes, I had to work really hard to find out, to see what was different. And I'm wondering if other people had the same, because the changes the were not highlighted in any way. And so in order to try to be thorough and make sure I got everything right, um, I had to work really hard and I'm not sure I did find everything that was actually a change. So like in the second section, I don't think genetic info is in the, the new paragraph. I don't know why it was taken out. Um, I could see additions and I, the additions made sense to me. So that's just a question. Um, moving right along <laughs> in the very long section D of the role of uh, the human rights director and in addressing complaints, I'm very clear that it's your job um, to do the investigation when something has been raised, but I'm not sure what our job is in reviewing or assisting or informing. So I'd love to know the answer to that. Um, yeah. So we're gonna re go over the com the complaint process, um, but I will say that uh, there was a lot of discussion among the HRC members last year about the role 
that the commission has, or actually I should to be more blunt about the lack of um, actions that the commission as a body can take. There's some historical um, rationale for why that doesn't uh, occur. Um, and, but I think again, that is up for discussion and I, you know, um, so Ronnie and, and Tyler can probably speak more to their thinking about the specific changes that were made in the in the document. Yeah. So maybe I should stop talking, but I, I just have a couple more questions. And then Ronnie and Tyler, you can just fill every all of us in on all of this. Um maybe just two more questions. Yeah, two more questions. And section five, which I don't know what page it is because they're not paginated, but um you know, if you keep scrolling down, if voluntary action is not forthcoming or deemed by the director to be inadequate, <clears throat> the director shall, after notice to all persons involved, and I don't really see what the difference is, but one of the potential actions that you could take, Pamela, is to report things to the Massachusetts State Police. And so I'm like, are criminal act complaints coming to this body? And why would we assess a criminal complaint before it goes into the criminal justice system. If this is in fact um, a system by which, um, oh, I for, I'm forgetting the word now, but there's a formal legal word when you. Um, so it's not an adjudicatory body, is that where? Well, I'm just confused. Like yeah. if it's not, then why would a criminal complaint come to us? And if, it's, if criminal complaints don't come to us, why would we refer something to the state police? We get all kinds of complaints. And so sometimes we need to figure out where those complaints actually lie. So that may be why that statement is there. Okay. So then it's, it's, that's a matter, then we wouldn't do any uh, analysis of it. We would just decide where to move it. Okay. Um, yeah. So this preface then, if voluntary action is not forthcoming or deemed inadequate, that doesn't seem like it's correct. It's accurate. It seems like there's an initial assessment of whether the complaint belongs to this committee and to the office of DEI, right? So, right. yeah, so um, I, I will just say that complaints come in a lot of different ways. So they can, uh, a person who's filing the complaint can call the office, that happens, or they um, might submit a form online or they could do so in writing and generally the director and the assistant director will make an initial assessment. Um, so for example, last year, when we received an online complaint about the situation with the high school or with the, yeah, was that middle school? Middle, middle school. school. Yeah. Um, immediately the response was that, that the complainant should, uh, should file at MCAD because we were, we're not going to be in a position to really yeah, I totally understand that. That makes all the sense in the world. I just think this language doesn't capture that. There should be language that says, you know, upon um, uh, there will be an initial assessment when a complaint is made as to whether or not it belongs in the scope of authority of the Office of DEI and this commission. And if not, it will be directed, you know, to the appropriate venue or something like that. So, so one other thing you... to, to think, oh, I'm sorry. The one other thing So I was thinking if you could figure out or write up some language like that, and then we could um, think about it and find out and where it goes, maybe before the end of the meeting or by our next uh, meeting and, and next week. So so what I would, would say is that there is no complaint process that's described anywhere. So this is the bylaw, right? Not the complaint process, which is another issue altogether. Got it. Okay, so maybe what needs to happen is the complaint process be, is described, and that then language from that is moved into this bylaw in summary or something like that. I hear you. I'm not going to continue talking about it right now. <laughs> and then my last question on the proposed procedure is that's all new. We we need to submit a report apparently to the town manager and civil rights agencies outside of Amherst as we deem as deemed appropriate, and um. It says we take reasonable precautions to protect privacy interests, but I'm not really clear what the content of the report is is supposed to cover. Um, and I'm assuming it's like, oh, we did this, you know, this is what we did all year. Um, 
Um, Philip did write a re and submit a report so that we can send out a copy of the report. I think if memory serves me right, it was about, it was a, like a two page summary of the actions of the committee. So it talked about the process of re looking at the bylaw. Um, it also reported on the number and the types of different uh, complaints that have come in. It requested additional funding for the commission to carry out their uh, cultural events. And, um, you know, so, someone else, I, you know, fill in the blanks if I've left things out. Great, and um, my apologies because it's in my blood. I have a law degree. This is how I look at documents. I just have a general question. Do we get, do you, does the office get calls saying not necessarily a complaint, but I have this issue, where do I take it as opposed to I'm making this complaint to you? So I would say um, yes, because we get all different types of calls. So um, another recent example was that uh, we got a call um, with a complaint or an issue with the Amherst Housing Authority, right? So, um, there are specific federal and state agencies that have authority over the housing authority, which is, would be the, you know, the best avenue to re, to resolve a complaint with the housing authority. But we try to intervene um, to the extent that we can um, on behalf of, of of folks. So another recent example is that um, uh, someone came into the office to um, make a complaint. Uh, um, against a private uh, sports organization in town. Um, so, I mean, as you said, lots of different types of complaints. I think folks feel that the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and the Human Rights Commission are places where they can voice a concern. So could I just get clear on how we're handling this, what the processes that you want to follow? Are we going around and posing our questions or are we going one by one or what are we doing here? I'm so, not sure how to. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's as co-chairs, it's up, that decision is up to you. You can um, ask me questions or you can um, decide that you wanna to, to, to review paragraph by paragraph. I think or, that people should just like Deborah did, um, you know, we've all read the document. We have some questions and voice our questions and see where we go from there. Um, to go tediously point by point, if there's no point in going to that point, makes no point. <laughs> Shall we go ahead and deal with uh, the questions Deborah raised? Because they're all quite significant and ones that we have talked about. So I think Tyler and I can provide background on some of that. I'd like to take number one, because I was the one who changed the definition. Um, and I think everyone felt like the focus on gender was not sufficient, that the Human Rights Commission has a broader mandate. And so I just went to the UN document that I could find most easily that had a broad based definition and put that forward. And I think it got stuck there. Um, I don't think the intent was to somehow um, reduce the importance of gender, but just to um, have this be more about broader, cover everything, including gender identity. The second issue was that I think going way back to Ben Ronnie, Huntington. Before you continue, I just want to say, if that was the only definition, wow, like how did that happen? And great that you expanded well, it and no need to just focus on gender. I totally agree. Okay, um, the other issue that came up, and maybe Tyler knows, but this I think went back to Je to Ben Harrington, where the definition of gender identity that was given in the previous bylaw was considered flawed and outdated. And But I didn't address that because I don't have the skills for that, but I did focus more on the fact that this is a human rights commission. And I felt like there wasn't enough um, within the commission or in the way we presented ourselves to emphasize human rights. And they are very well articulated in so many documents, as you know. Um, so I wanted it to be broader. 
So it wasn't, um, yeah, so that's what was behind that. And I'm certainly open to elaborating on it, but I don't want people to read it and think this is a gender commission. It's a commission about all the human rights. Um, so then um, I'm gonna just address one more thing, which was the question of reporting to the time, town manager versus the town council. And then that one, I think you can add more on Tyler and then you can speak to some other questions that were raised. Um, I think this is really a question we talked about and when we presented or when Philip presented the human rights report to the town council, they explicitly asked us to advise them on human rights policy. So I think we should put that in here because they asked for it. And I think they understood that was part of our job. Um, I don't think the town manager can negate the work of a commission. It, what it says here is simply that the town manager may or may not choose to bring it up with the town council, but there's nothing stopping us from bringing up an issue with the town council. Um, but we may need to be more specific about our uh, mandate to, uh, to advise the town council to sort of reserve and make explicit our option to go directly to the town council on issues. That's fantastic. So I, maybe I misunderstood, Pamela, you're saying that these changes went to the town manager and he's supposed to either approve or reject them. And that's what I was speaking of. Like, does Paul have the power to say, no, I don't agree with these proposed changes? Um, one of the questions the our town council member asked when we presented the human rights report, we noted in there that the bylaws had been changed, but we were awaiting hearing from the town council. And actually one of the town council members asked, why hasn't it gone through? And has it not? And I think I said, no, it has not. It's waiting for the town manager's approval and it still has not been approved. So. That's why I was saying it would like we would like to know when we'll get approval or what's holding up, holding him up from sending it to the legal team that has to look at it from a legal lens. Oh, I um, see. So it's a, uh, hmm. it's a process check to ensure that everything is legally okay. It's not his analysis of whether or not he likes this word or that word. That's reassuring. Yeah. Okay. I think that uh, I got the impression when um, Philip presented the uh, human rights report that the town council was very open to the commission and I've had informal communications that they want us to be doing our work and reporting on our work. I think um, with regards to the complaints process, uh, I also definitely want to see a active role for the Human Rights Commission in adjudicating complaints. But the problem with that is the volume of complaints and the amount of time that each one demands is simply too great for a commission that meets uh, for a couple of hours once a month to handle. Theoretically, it could mean that we end up with complaints sitting for months waiting for review and we don't have the time to conduct even superficial analysis because in the span of a couple hours of meeting, we're going to have debate as we try to figure stuff out. We won't have as much ability as an individual person would in their spare time to look up corroborating information or even to send a response email to request further information from someone fire, filing a complaint. Um, in general, we're just not versatile enough to fill an active quasi-judicial role like that. However, I think um, point seven under uh, section D, although I don't really remember the full numbering schemes, but it could also be section D under 0.5 or whatever. Um, but 0.7 under the complaints process, um, I think is where we end up with a bit more potential for the commission to take an active role. I'd like to see, not under the bylaws, but under our working procedures. And I think that I did leave some notes on that during the bylaw review, although I don't have my computer with me now, so I can't pull them up to check. Um, but I'd like to see something where for complaints that are deemed to be within the scope of the commission that seem to be worth further investigation, then um, the co-chair of the commission bring it 
to the attention of the entire commission so that we can conduct a more general discussion. And I also would like to see some of these processes surrounding um, reconciliation, surrounding any investigation that could be within the, our purview to be conducted by the commission as a whole for cases of sufficient complexity, sufficient gravity of that in some way, shape, or form qualify for a broader commission review. Although, of course, it is worth noting that any case that comes before us is going to be a very large time commitment on our part. So that would not be something for the majority of instances, I'd assume. One of the things that we need to be really careful of, especially when we have handling complaints, is the number of people um, allowed access to the complaint um, can sometimes um, get out of hand when it comes to confidentiality. So that's one of the areas in which we really need to be careful as to how many people have access to information. So not just the number of people involved, but anything that's before the entire board uh, would re have to be done in, um, in a, uh, a public meeting, right? So there would be no privacy for any of the individuals, which is I think traditionally why the practice had been that the director, so prior to this role, um, of investigation falling to the Office of uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It was handled by the Human um, Rights, or sorry, Human Resources Director. And generally the conversations would be limited between the Human Resources Director and the Commission's co-chairs. More involvement beyond that means that it's public and um, the ability to protect the privacy of the individuals is compromised in that way. There's um, also there's specific state legislation which allows for an exception to the open meeting law if the uh, conversation is mediation, which is why it talks about um, mediation. And because the body does not have the authority to subpoena or to mandate participation, it has to be voluntary. So if if either of the people involved in the allegation are, are of wrongdoing are unwilling to come before the commission or to interact with the director, there's nothing that can be done. So we did start to discuss some options for that. Normally the commission would meet in person and so everybody in the public would hear the complaint. But we did talk about options where instead of just going to the co-chairs, because the co-chair seemed to know all the details of all the complaints and I said, well, what do we do? Well, why have the rest of us? Um, I think we can pick a sub group. We can pick any two people um, from the commission per complaint. So that's an option we talked about. It doesn't have to be the co-chairs. It may be that it's about an issue that Deborah knows more about or Rizwana knows more about. And so that way the commission, the commission, all the commission's resources come into play and it's not just the co-chairs who are always involved in the cases. And at the same time, you maintain the confidentiality of the, uh, of the parties involved. Uh, I don't know what happened to that idea, but I had come forward with that and Jen has her hands up. I was gonna say that, that Jennifer had her hand up one time ago. So I was just gonna give some more historical context about the way that the human rights complaints have been handled and processed. So at one point the chair would participate with the acting, with the director of human resources, who was also the director of human rights in the complaint process when it came to the mediation piece of it and advise. Um, and then at some point it was kind of hard to schedule a time to have the chair to come. So this has gone back and forth within these bylaws of different ways based on who is at the in the commission and how much they can participate. And so at that point, the chair wasn't able to come. So then it was just the human rights, human resources director. And then it became the human resources director. And then I was reporting back to the human rights commission, leaving out the major details about the individual themselves. But the thought process was 
if we reported back and say within six months there were eight complaints about, I don't know, Jim Dandy's ice cream shop, right? Then that would be a cue for the Human Rights Commission to kind of want to step in and get a little bit involved or or find out what's going on or, or find a way to really uh, approach Jim Dandy's ice cream shop, right? Because that was there was a pattern that was there because there were so many complaints. And so this is something that forever changes because of the people who serve, right? Not everybody can always leave work to come and sit in a mediation period. So it's forever changing. So I, I don't know if necessarily you want to have it so finite that it doesn't leave room for the flexibility for the next group of people who come in. But I also understand that you don't want it so broad. And I having the so at, prior to the pandemic these meetings were held in public in a room you know maybe two or three people would attend the meeting but it could you imagine trying to bring a complaint to the hrc in that manner and then there was the thought about going through executive session and then having that person approach the group during executive session however depending on who it is, the person who they're complaining about or the the entity that they're complaining about could still somehow be in there, right? Like if you think about it, if they know that they're going to the Human Rights Commission and it's executive session, that both individuals could be in the room. And when they break for executive session, one person leaves, but the other one doesn't. So to some degree, there's this need to protect the complaintant, right? That's the most important thing. So that's just a little bit of history that goes back. It just shows a lot of change. Yeah, that's really helpful. I want to clarify. I'm not arguing that the Human Rights Commission should be the entity that, you know, oversees um, the complaint process at all. Um, Jennifer, what you just mentioned really, uh, something you just mentioned really appeals to me. Since I've been here, I haven't seen any reports on the aggregate number of complaints, the categories of which the complaints are, whether or not there are any patterns in terms of <clears throat> the folks who are being accused of you know, doing something that would fall within our purview. So I have no information whatsoever of what the history is and what the current docket is. And it does seem to me that if we're going to be in some relationship with this process, that we should at least get informational reports. And yes, they can be totally purged of identifiers of names, right? And I would love to know if there are any patterns, you know, so I think, and then if there are, I think that's something for us then to discuss. And I he I totally hear the public information, you know, the, the nature of the public information requirements um, and how that <clears throat> limits our capacity to take action. And if in fact it can be the co-chairs or two designated individuals that doesn't require that public facing um, it, you know, transparency, that's that would be great. So to look at that, if we look at um, part H, not less than twice a year, the director in conjunction with the town manager should inform the commissioner of the director's activities. That's where we would get some of that information. Um, and given that, I had a question about that. Um, does this happen in writing or during one of our monthly meetings? And then the other question or comment that I wanna make, other than what's already been discussed because I had some of some other questions, but we've already discussed them is, we have now given this, our town manager, our report twice. It is now October, so he's had it for at least three months. And what is our next step to say to him, hello, <laughs> we really need to get moving on this. So I don't I, have I proposed that we report to the town. It is on. Oh, it's off. Yeah. I would propose that we report to the town council on this retreat and that we're limited by the fact that our bylaw has been stuck um, with no um, no idea of when it might even be released. I wanted to make one other comment and it's about the complaints, which I think it's really an important part of our function. So I do wanna see the commission involved and I think it can be done protecting confidentialities. It does require that we be honest about our availability and not just jump on cases unless we're willing to put in the time that's required. Um, to do that. 
So I, I think that um, t two things. So obviously, I, I think re reporting back to the town council, that that's probably a, a, a smart move to do. On the issue of the complaint, what Jennifer and I have done uh, previously is uh, we've made the co-chairs aware of complaints that have come in. And um, the uh, since the annual report, which included everything through the end of June, I don't believe we've had, I, Jennifer can correct me, have we had a formal complaint come in? That's my other concern, yeah. that there were only seven complaints in all of last year on the report. And I um, I did saw it when the when I saw the annual report, and I thought, well, what? Only seven complaints in all of Amherst? That seems shockingly low to me. So that's one of the reasons that I felt the definition should be made clear and put out there, and there should be education to the public. I would uh, say the. I would say the majority of the community probably does not know that this is a process. Yes. What I would say is prior to working for the town, I did not know yeah. that this was an option. And so when you think about whether or not, if you knew it was an option before you became involved in the HRC too, which just kind of shows that this isn't out the way that it mm -hmm. should be. Um, and then the other thing is we there's only so much that HRC can do. So some people are turned off by that, right? Like we're there's not much that we can actually do. We can't sanction anybody. We can't go into any entity and say, you have to do this or do that. We can, you know, for the most part, what we do is is bring people along that, I'm going to say, bring it along the journey of the complaint process, right? So help them get to MCAD, help them get to the labor law, you know, whomever general attorneys general's office, if they need help with getting paperwork or information to them, we help with that. But there's only so much that we can do. I will say, with that being said, though, it's very interesting that I have seen things change very quickly when an entity gets a phone call from the director of the human rights, right? Like when you get that call from the town, some people do move to make the changes that are needed in order because they just, it, you know, even though they might not know that we don't really have any, there's nothing that we can do, having that phone call come in can change the behavior sometimes. It's also important to document these things so that we have an idea, as Deborah was saying earlier, I think if we start to see patterns of types of complaints, and those can be taken up by appropriate bodies within town. I um, completely agree. and But the other thing is that's why it's so important to have people fill out the form itself so that because that way we have an actual document it's not necessarily just a phone call and then you're working with them having them complete that and so for people I, we will have them come in I will type up their complaint for them in the form and then have them sign off on it if you know they feel like they can't do that but it's important that it goes through that process of the form so that we have that actual documentation there and it stays and it's housed in a in a space where you know, we can pull stuff out from Excel. We can pull all of the the complaints out of, you know, through an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, I have a question also. Uh, is there any way CRESS people are involved in this process of complaint uh, documentation or mediating or just the process, the CRESS people? Not currently, no. no. So I just want to say that... Um, when I read the H the bylaw and read the process or the lack of a process last year when I started the position, I had a very strong reaction. Uh, I think um, that tr creating a commission that takes on more of an adjudicatory process of investigating, reviewing complaints and trying to respond to them um, in my opinion, is a little bit ill-advised because you do not have the authority to act upon them. And so there is a real um, risk and people feeling that this is an avenue that can provide them with, um, you know, with a resolution to a problem when you don't have the authority to do it. So one of the things that, I mean, and the commission felt very differently than that. So, you know, you as a body will just decide what you want to do. In the retreat materials from last year, uh, I 
provided the, and you all have those copies of the, those documents because they were emailed to you, provided examples of the work that's being done by human rights commissions across the Commonwealth. Some do very little, some attempt to do very uh, a lot. And I think the important thing is to try to find the middle ground where you are both being uh, um, you know, effective in your roles, but taking on responsibilities that you don't have the legal authority to do is ill-advised. It's ill-advised for the commission and it's ill-advised, in my opinion, for those people who would be making complaints because you can't resolve their problems. They, the problems have to seek resolution elsewhere and to suggest that we can, can resolve a problem when we can't it has to be voluntary. It's only mediation. And, and that's a very limited um, authority. So I, I, several things are, pop, are popping up for me. One is that I think we have agreement in the room that we need to educate the residents of Amherst that this process exists and what it is, that it's, um, that it's voluntary potential for reconciliation and um, agreement that we're not an adjudicatory body. Um, and two, that there, it, I think it would be great to have two pe two members of this commission, maybe the co-chair, two co-chairs, if that's what they want to do, maybe a co-chair and another person, whatever it is, to work to support Pamela when um, a, an issue, a complaint arises where people are interested in voluntary reconciliation. So we can support that process, um, add, you know, whatever our expertise, intelligence, and I don't know, whatever we have. Um, I also want, I, I just am reminded of this, the profound impact that this can have, um, because when I lived in Portland, there was an entire organization devoted um, to victim support services. And their job was, first of all, to provide trauma-informed care to those who were harmed, and thus then to direct them to whatever process does did work for them in terms of adjudication, just as you're describing, um, and then to help maybe even um, journey with them to assist them as they walked through the process of making a complaint to this body or that body. It was very impactful. It's not nothing. I just want to say it's not nothing. Um, and a, a lot of the people, everyone they supported were people who are, who did not have privileged resources, money, you know, they couldn't go to daddy and get daddy to hire a lawyer to, to take care of something. Right. They were immigrants, refugees, people, um, and poverty people who were traditionally um, didn't have access to ease of, you know, solving problems legally. So I, I just want to say it's not nothing. It's actually something very significant. But it can only be significant if we actually educate people about what it is. And uh, I agree with you, Pamela. I don't think, you know, I don't see how we could be an adjudicatory body. We don't have those rights vested in us. So, um, yeah, thanks. Oh, and I did want to add that I just, for those, if anyone in the public is here, um, I just joined the commission in June. So when I say I haven't heard or I haven't seen, it's only been a couple of months. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh, when I, I don't think the idea is that we would do anything more than be part of that reconciliation process, but that it I would like it not to be so hierarchic that it's only the co-chairs that are notified, but that we try to spread it around so that um, other commission members can be involved in particular because we have so many resources that I think can support and help you all in the process of managing the complaints. Um, that's on the managing side. There's still the education side, which I guess we'll talk about what our plan is for that when we get to planning. So one um, suggestion might finish. be, um, sorry, to, would be to then suggest a revision of the of that section of the bylaw to say that um, the uh, complaint process will include the HR director and two members of the commission to be appointed by the co-chairs or however. I mean, I'm just but thinking that 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 might be um, a revision that you'd want to include. It already says the DEI director, right? And it sounds like you already do work with the co-chairs. Right. That's what I heard from Philip. 
Yeah. We do work with the co-chairs. I'm just saying it doesn't have to only be the co-chairs because the rest of the commission, like I joined, and wasn't until I saw the annual report that I realized there were even any complaints. So, so I'm thinking that I think you're saying the same thing, but yeah. a different way. Yeah, I'm just saying it doesn't have to just be the coach. Right. And so I'm saying that what I'm suggesting is a revision of the by of the bylaw to state that because the bylaw now talks about the relationship between the director and the co chairs. You so you'd want the language to reflect the director and any two members of the commission so that you would have the ability to appoint um, any two. So well, Ronnie, we you would have to that. make, you would have to make a motion that that would be a, re a revision to our bylaws. You would then have to hit a second, then we would have a discussion and then a vote. Well, I'm not ready to make a motion because I think the motion isn't that the DI director adds on to their work by deciding who the two people will be, but rather maybe there isn't a change required that it just comes to the, you do what you normally do and we say, okay. We know. can't say that if it's not in the bylaws to say it. Jennifer? Okay. I was just gonna say then, before then you- we add that? Yeah, before you vote to put that in there, it would be great if you really flesh out how that yeah. process is going to happen when it occurs, right? Because you don't want to have to wait to have two people choose it in the middle right. of a meeting because you right. guys meet once a month. And, and that would be part of the be discussion via email because that's problematic too. Exactly. So that, wait, 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 wait. As part of procedure, that would be part of the discussion. So before <laughs> we go forward, if there was going to be a change in the language, there needs to be a motion, a second, a discussion, and a vote. So all of this that we're talking about is null and void unless we have a motion and a second. Could can you, I make a motion? Before you do that, could I just ask that you alert everyone so we all know which text we're looking at? Like what number is the thing that we're changing? So everyone knows what we're voting on. And then you can go ahead and make So it. actually, I think that um, this change, as I'm looking at it now, might have been already included. So if you look at the fourth page in your packet, uh, F6, it states, the director shall inform the chair and vice chair or co-chairs of the commission of all complaints and utilize any member of the Human Rights Commission with subject matter expertise and provide a summary of the final outcome to the co-chair. So I think that would accomplish what you're describing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, and I so don't, so, don't so I just have a curiosity and then maybe a different motion. Um, this says that you will uh, provide information, summary of the final outcome to the co-chairs. Is there any way that the entire commission can get at every meeting a summary of the current dockets of complaints with no, you know, totally uh, with removed. identifiers removed. So I think you'll, you should um, define what you mean by docket. Do you mean the uh, name of the complainant or do you mean the type of complaint and when the complaint came in? And remember that any document that we produced will be a public record and be. Right, so um, if, I, if we're discussing, maybe I need to make a motion about um, having um, monthly reports to the entire commission that have no identifying information whatsoever, but are categorically described. Um, so we know if there are uh, complaints against commercial establishments and what the nature of the complaint is you know, discrimination or refusal to serve, or I don't know, or is it a complaint against the town of Amherst, or is it complaint against um, another municipal entity? So I, so we know the category of who is, um, who is accused of doing harm, and we know the general category of what the harm is. And we know how many live complaints there are. So from month to month, we'll know 
if there were three live complaints in January and in March there's no live complaints, that whatever the things have been taken care of. That's we not a motion. Need to be very careful. So I just need the motion piece you to go back to the motion right. part so because you kind of motion? went right. on with the motion. Right, because people were asking me for clarification. I move that there be information but that would there be mandatory reporting to the commission without okay. identifiers with no identifiers of the docket of current of active complaints monthly monthly yeah i have monthly reports to the entire commission without identifiers of i second active complaints so you have I'm a motion by the deborah motion. second by ronnie discussion the one piece of the discussion that I would like to add to that before a vote is that if we're asking for a report, then it is a report, not a discussion at either monthly meeting, because we can't have too many people discussing all of these complaints. So you have to be very clear that it is a report, not a discussion. So agree. the only other concern is then that goes into your packet, which is public. So, but I would say if you think about it from the person who's bringing the complaint, that that might not feel as comfortable as you would like it to. Well, if the complaint <laughs> were described as being from an individual or a business or, you know, it it could be anybody, right? Do you think people will feel threatened if they say an individual brought a complaint against a business that had to do? I mean, here's the thing about making a decision for other people is you just have no idea. And so some people are going to feel some kind of way and other people will not. I, I just ask that we take all of that into consideration first. So I would make a suggestion that um, that the report simply be a, a list of the type of complaint received and the date, right? That would give you uh, um, information about the number that was coming out without information yeah. about whom the complaint was um, about, um, against or who, or who might have brought the complaint. So we received a complaint um, alleging housing discrimination on blank date or failure to provide access on blank date. So you just have the subject matter and the date. I see Tyler is trying to speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what we would be accomplishing by putting a report in the bylaws as opposed to just the procedures by which we process the complaints. My concern is, although I don't really see anything wrong with the report right now, and I think that for our current needs, it's probably a good idea, my concern is that making a bylaw overly specific risks 10 years down the line that practice for some reason or another no longer meeting the needs of the community. And as we've seen for the over the past year, revising the bylaw is a rather complicated process and imposing a monthly obligation on the chairs. Um, imagine, for example, that in 10 years, the commission meets once every two months or twice a month, and then the needs for updates on uh, complaints changes, or if it turns out that monthly reports end up um, subverting anonymity because everyone can tell within the span of a month what the report was about, um, and then we decide later that it should have been every six months. Uh, I think that having it in just procedures or in the policies of the Human Rights Department makes it more versatile. Obviously, the disadvantage of that is that then you just need to trust that the Human Rights Department and the co-chairs are going to faithfully um, see that as a duty, keep it in the procedures. But I don't think that we have an environment in this town or in this commission where that would be much of a problem, at least for the um, near and medium term. And secondly, I also see the commission's role in some of these complaints. Um, and in any response that the commission as a whole could make as being more of a fact-finding role. Since as an advisory commission, we obviously have a huge stake in fact-finding and figuring out what's going on in the community so that we can appropriately advise the town manager and council on these issues. Um, and I think that that fits in well with our lack of subpoena power because you can still conduct fact-finding processes without being able to compel testimony. Um, I think as well that that also could fit in the 
um, in just general policies rather than in a bylaw. But I think that what the commission should be doing in a fact-finding role, when that should kick in, what sort of complaints and what that would look like definitely merits further discussion down the line, if not now, in the next couple of months as we're looking over the policies for handling complaints and the aftermath of them. Okay. So I have, can I rescind I have... my motion? Is that allowed procedurally? I totally agree with you. It belongs mm -hmm. in procedures and not in bylaws. I think I was driven to make the motion because there's an incredible amount of specificity, specificity mm -hmm. in these bylaws, many of which probably belong in procedures and not in bylaws. Because yeah. what I agree yeah. with everything you said. You can rescind it. Does that, make, does that now negate your question? Because you had your hand up to, to respond to something. Well, actually, I was agreeing with uh, Tyler also, because I right now see there's a lot of nitpicking about these uh, details, but overall the role of human, uh, you know, re this Human Rights Commission is basically to investigate and complete uh, complaint resolution. And and the way we do is by investigating complaints related to human rights violations and discrimination. And we mediate disputes, conduct hearings, and recommend remedies to address these violations. So basically, I agree you know, with what's going on because we need to look into it and more, uh, and it should be our responsibility. So how we do it is a process that we need to come to. Thanks. So Deborah, would you like to now rescind your motion? I rescind my motion and um, uh, look forward to working on the procedures. <laughs> and we might also want to assess whether any of these other line items belong in procedures and not in bylaws. And we're all okay with that, Ronnie, as you second. Yeah, I wanted the discussion and we've had it. Thank you. Okay, no vote necessary. Motion rescinded. So is there any further discussion on the bylaws or are you, do you want to move ahead to the commission charge? The only other um, thing that I still have is, do we talk about how we get our town manager to either respond or what our next step is? If he doesn't respond, I think that one of us, Pamela, <laughs> should um, say to him or write to him and CC either the commission or the co-chairs that we he's now been in, pro, um, he's now had this document for three months and we're looking for how to proceed based on his recommendation, um, approval, or denial and what we need to do in the next steps. Are you guys I'd making I'd like to any... add that we should ask him when, what date we can expect a response from him. Yes. Are and you then... making any changes to the bylaw though today? Well, I'm there are not. two places I want to clarify this question on number five where we talked about the Massachusetts State Police. Is this okay or is there new language coming from Deborah? I do think it's confusing. I can offer other language. I also okay, have to so admit let's... that I, th these are excerpts. I have not not seen the entire the bylaws in their entirety, and so I, from so this, shall we I say do... you'll look at it and <laughs> respond to uh, to the commission? Yeah, I, if somebody could get this. me the entire okay. bylaw document, that'd be great. Thank and you. And then the last thing that we left um, standing was the all new part at the very end. Are we resolved on that? Is that okay as is? And if not, what are we going to do about that? I think there was a question raised about, um, I just had a question mark here. I think you had raised a question about content of that report. Of the reports, right. Yeah. And again, you know, going back to Tyler's point, I don't think this needs to be in the bylaws. Okay, the specific so then we're yeah, done. But I do have a curiosity. Okay, so just to be clear, my um, directive from the commission is to have a conversation with the town manager and obtain a date when you can expect a response on the proposed bylaws. Can I clarify one more point about the question? 
Um, is he responding to you or is he responding to the commission? We have a meeting on October 18th. We have a meeting on November 15th. So those are two dates he we could actually ask him to attend our meeting and respond, or is he responding to you? I think that's your you have the power to decide the answer to that question. <laughs> But you have to decide whether you want to invite him to one of those two meetings or whether you uh, want him to respond to me. So in the meantime, I'm assuming that we are going by the old bylaws until he approves the new bylaws. So I make a motion that we invite the town manager to our October 18th meeting to respond to our proposed bylaws, hear from the commission, answer any questions, and have his approval by our November 15th meeting date. Made a proposal. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Wait, is there any question? Yes. Um, if he's coming on the 18th and he's not due to approve till the 15th, what do we want from him on the 18th? I want him to be able to come ask us any clarifying questions, um, see where his head is at, um, have him challenge us, um, have us respond to him, um, have Deborah ask him all these questions that she has. <laughs> <laughs> and then have him respond to us. He may have questions. If he doesn't have questions, then he can say, I looked at him and I approve him as of today. I support him coming. I would like to rethink giving him any kind of November 15 deadline because if he's coming, he needs to be able to ask his questions and say yes or no. Yeah. So I'll just so given that given that today is the seventh, eighth. And we don't have work tomorrow, which means he won't get this um, proposal or this request until the 10th, though he has had the report since the July. I propose that the meeting be on the 15th. That gives him more than a month to look at and deal with the situation. So I, I just wanna um, to point out two things that you should think of. If you invite him on the 18th and he has questions, there's opportunity for you to have a dialogue and then for him to go back to uh, legal counsel. He's not legal counsel. And if your questions require a uh, review of the attorneys, then it you know he's not gonna be able to, to do that. So what I'm not clear about you know, I don't think he's making any decision. I think he's just passing it on to the legal counsel. So why isn't he passing it on, I guess is my question. It seems like a simple, clear thing to do. I mean, well, he's passing stuff on to the legal counsel all the time because we hear in the town council meetings that legal reviewed this and legal reviewed that. So the question is, why is this not moving along? And we don't it's... know if it's not moving along. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to come to the meeting to find out where the stuck place is. I'm sorry, um, we do know that it's not moving along because he hasn't said that he's given it to the legal counsel, has he? I, I don't know whether it's gone to legal counsel, counsel or not. Um, I, I will also point out that the KP law, which is the legal counsel for the town, represents about two thirds of the cities and towns in the Commonwealth. And as in any, uh, you know, as in any community, as issues arrive, some things that are placed on the table get pushed down because of other priorities. Like, so I, I'm not saying that that should happen, but realistically, it, over the last, uh, you know, few weeks, months, there have been some very important issues that have risen um, up in line on the priority list. And that's just a reality of life. 
So are we back at the place where we're inviting um, <laughs> the yes. town manager yes, on? I do meeting. believe so. Yes. Yeah. Great. I it, would just add one small comment that important is a subjective term. Um, that's it. So again, I made a motion for the 18th. Excuse me. I just would like to add that in between the, the time of the date, 18th, can he give us some kind of a response via you? And so we get to know what we are expecting on that specific date that is the next uh, meeting. So can I just say first, I made a motion. I need a second before all this discussion oh, is supposed to happen. Okay, yeah. second. I'm seconding that motion for October 18th, right? So a motion, yeah. motion made by Elizabeth Haygood, second by Ronnie and by Deborah. Um, now that discussion that we just had previous to this should come forward and so I mean uh, I cannot I can propose or ask a question I cannot guarantee or dictate what the response will be understood so. any more discussion all in favor aye aye aye, aye. so opposed any abstentions Motion passes six to zero that um, Pamela asked our town manager to attend our meeting on the 18th to discuss where we are with our by bylaw revisions. And uh, I commit to checking out that one place um, when I have the entire bylaws, which is does not need a motion, I don't think. And I have a quick curiosity. We have mentioned that there's no procedures in place and we have also talked about like educating the populace about um, this role of the Human Rights Commission. And I don't know how those things move forward. I, they're not so, bylaw revisions, they're just actions. I'm just looking at the agenda. I really wanna be sure we get to point F, which is our priorities and goals for 2023. And maybe then we can talk about what those are and how we would do them. Um, yeah, I don't wanna be completely stuck here. And there are procedures, by the way, um, right? There are no procedures for handling a complaint. Didn't we review procedures? I remember commenting on them. So I want to just say that if, are we done with our bylaw review discussion? Because then we can move on to our commission charge and some of these things will come up. And as we go over the commission charge, the complaint process yeah. and the roles and responsibilities, which is the, in the next agenda items. So well, I we'll want to ask if um, people would like to have a five minute recess Yes. So I was going to say, for those of you who don't know, the restrooms are right outside the hallway on the right-hand side. I think a lot of times we are... Um...
Okay. We are back at, um, in our meeting. The next um, item on our retreat is our co commission charge. Pamela. Yeah, so the commission charge is page uh, three of your packet. And I would um, uh, give you just a few minutes, uh, five minutes or so, just to read over it. The, the charge sets the framework for the work that you are scheduled to do as a commission. Just wanted to give new members an opportunity to have that document in front of them and uh, ask any questions if they have any. So it seems that everyone um, has had an opportunity to uh, read the charge. There are two things that I would like to bring to your attention that um, I noticed. Um, the, ch the charge states that four members shall constitute a quorum by vote of the town meeting with the human rights bylaw. I'll need to uh, uh, review and uh, double check that by, because by number, your quorum should be five. And it may have been that at the time that the charge was written, the commission was smaller in number. Um, the second thing th that um, I wanted to bring to your attention for you to think about is the charge summary. Uh, one suggestion that I would make would be to uh, make sure that the language in the charge summary is consistent with the language of the bylaw. That might be a place where you would want to have identical language, but that's, um, you know, at the discretion of the commission. And can I just go up to say the appointed authority is the select board? We don't have a select board, do we? So yeah. I think that should say town council and or town manager. Yeah, I, th I don't think any of these documents, including the, uh, the appointing committee um, handbook have been updated since the charter. I think that the town council at some point made an attempt to go through and do all of that because they gave a template for what they would want the committee charges to look like so that everyone's was, you know, you know the same. And I think it's just something that they haven't f fully completed yet, that process. For those of have... you who are new, we used to have a select board, but we do not have one anymore. So that needs to change immediately. I have a uh, few questions of clarification about the text. Sorry, were you speaking, Deborah? They're just questions of clarification. Um, so there's reference to to ensure that and to ensure that INSURE, and it may be because English is not my first language that I just want to be sure, do you mean to ensure? And if it is to ensure, uh, are we really expected to ensure 
we have no authority whatsoever. So that's just a question. I don't really, you know, I mean, I'm fine having insure in there, but I don't know what insure means. So I just want to be clear about that because it's repeated. Um, and then I have this question at the very end of the mission where it says, and I don't know how I missed this before, assist the town manager and human resources and human rights director in the achievement of affirmative actual action and equal opportunity objectives. So it would be good if you could circulate those to us because I don't think I've seen a statement of the town's affirmative action and equal opportunity objectives. So those are my two questions. Yeah. The affirmative actions were up, revised and updated, I think, in 20. 16, there was an Amherst College intern who came in and created the, or revised the current, revised the affirmative action goals, but we can send those out to you. Thank you. Can we also take a look at gender and add gender identity? As if we have gender identity and or take out gender and put gender identity or leave them both in, whichever, I don't care. So I'm the language actually, you know, obviously predates me. I, I don't. Yeah. But um, insure is the wrong word. Or, right, right. I think right, they yeah. mean insure. Insure, e right. Exactly. Neither insure nor insure are within our capacity. Right. Neither so is within our capacity. We, it so doesn't I don't matter. Know. You don't have to parse that. Uh, I'm just it does matter. I'm wondering our me. process here. Are we actually editing this in this moment? Do we need to put out. Um, do no. we need to vote on things? Like, how, what's our process? Because you mentioned, Pamela, that it should be five members. I don't think we need to vote. That's a fact. We move from seven to nine members. The quorum is five. Can we just say that? But that needs to be updated. So I, I believe, and Jennifer will have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the charge to uh, needs to be corrected. Um, and that is outside of the purview of this commission. But I, the... the purpose of including the charge in today's uh, retreat was to have everybody understand what the roles and responsibilities and the work of the commission is. But in reviewing it last night, I noted several things that I think need to be corrected. So I don't think we have the authority to correct them, but certainly things that need to be corrected, we should, we should observe and point out so that they can be. Great. So can we go in order? Can we all agree that the quorum, we need to propose to the town council that the quorum be changed from four to five. Do we need to discuss that? I hope not. It's like nine members, that's just what it is. Um, I, I actually, um, Liz, was thinking that the select board language doesn't have to change because this is historical in, in June 15th, 1998. I'm talking about up here. Oh. <laughs> There's no select board for us to be a, a, correct. A, 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 so the town council approves our our gotcha. So yes, thank you. So do we need to vote or call a motion? Can we just say that Pamela, you'll also go back to the town council and change the select board to the town council? Fantastic. Um, and then I have a question, um, which I don't want us to spend time discussing, but I just I have been concerned and confused and weirded out by the fact that I'm a special municipal employee since I joined this commission. I'm not an employee. I wasn't hired. I'm, a, I'm not paid. I am a, I am a volunteer. So I'm not going to, it's not going to, I'm not going to leave this commission because of this bizarre language, but I don't understand it. And I don't know that I need to be educated, but I wonder if anyone else has that curiosity. So that's um, coming up and that's in the, yeah. uh, you are by legislation. So regardless yeah. of whether you... <laughs> Whether you want to be or not, by state legislation, you are considered, so. Yeah, I don't like that either, and I was given same answer. I think that's just what they want to call us, and they can do what they want. Yeah. But as I see it, um, I'm a volunteer. By any definition in any statute, other than this one, an employee is someone who's hired and paid, you know. But whatever, okay. Moving I, right along. <laughs> I think that's why special's in front of it because it's not the same. Moving right along. All right. So we only have two things that need to be uh, changed so that they're accurate on that first page. On our mission, the next page, 
Um, Liz said, wait, aren't there, there are three things on the committee charge that need to be changed. Oh, what was the third? So the inshore part, the appointing oh, that's authority. That's on the mission. Is that all right, also in the committee charge? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what word should we use? I think the intent was ensure, and I fully understand that we cannot ensure, but I think that was the intent. Anyway, we don't write this document. The per We just need to understand what it's saying, because... And isn't the appointing authority the town manager, though? He appointed you guys all, mm -hmm. not town council. Mm -hmm. Under the charter, I believe it's the town manager yeah, who's the. But didn't the town council have to approve that appointment? They would have to approve your charge, would probably have to go to G uh, governance legislation and organization, but, or TSO, one of the two. <laughs> I could swear the town council voted on our appointments. They did. They do, but the town manager is appointing you. Right. Okay. Yeah. They're simply approving his action, but he's taking the action. Right. So rather than us debate what the right word is, I think maybe, Pamela, if you could go back to whoever and say that that word ensure is not accurate and ask them to modify it so that it's appropriate. So we don't have to work at, and then that we'll do whatever they do. If they change it, we'll at change our mission, which is on the next page, to use the same, maybe use the same word, or since it's our mission, do, are we in charge of that document, of this few paragraphs? There's some other things in here. I'll oh. go back to the committee charge, oh. and the commission, in conjunction with the human rights director, should say the DEI director. So under oh. the current def definition of the responsibilities of the DEI director. The DEI director has wears both the human rights director and the DEI director hat. So in the proposed bylaw, we noted that the human rights uh, director is uh, currently the DEI director. So I think you can leave that language as is. But do a hashtag and put both. I'm just asking. Hashtag, what's that thing? Okay. That backslash, bash, bash, backslash. Is that what it's called? It is, but there also the leaving. town manager could appoint another person to be right. the human rights director. Like at one point we had a, just a specific human rights director, which was different. So the town manager is the appointing individual there. So that's... I do think that there's another point um, that's somehow simultaneously overly technical and overly broad, but might be worth looking at, um, which is that a kind of central part of our charge and mission, and it's also repeated in the bylaws, is that um, our duty is to ensure that no person, uh, public or private, I don't know exactly what it means by public or private with reference to a person, I'm pretty sure that's meant to incorporate corporations, in which case there's a whole other thing there, but um, shall be denied any rights guaranteed pursuant to local, state, and or federal law on the basis of, and then it lists a variety of protected classes. Um, my issue with that is I know under federal law, at least, and under state law as well, and I'm fairly confident under local law, it already states that if there's a right in that law, it can't be denied on the basis of any of those classes. It seems like a bit of a redundancy. Um, like, obviously, I can see why it's in there, because our mission is to ensure um, uh, the 14th Amendment equal protection is um, implemented. But the way how it's phrased seems to introduce a degree of redundancy. And I wonder whether that bears relevance upon our mission in the way that we should be conducting um, our duties. I'm not sure the answer to that question, Tyler, but I uh, appreciate your focusing our attention on that paragraph because I didn't even, I just skipped right by it and I have another concern there. So while we're holding open the question that Tyler raised, I wanna say that 
um, affectional or sexual mm -hmm. preference is outdated language that is no longer used. Sexual orientation is the phrase that's yeah. used. And lifestyle, I think, likens to the same um, outdated language, although maybe it's supposed to mean something else. Like if you live, I don't know, in a multi-generational house, I have no idea, but I think it's well, alluding to the garden oh. under a bridge. Uh, so that was my um, suggestion is that um, whatever language is adopted for the bylaw be replicated here so that you're consistent in your language for both the bylaw and the charge. And so is this mission statement, what's in the bylaw? I'm trying to figure out the next page or what's the mission? No, it is not. So um, the the bylaw language is uh, the proposed bylaw language is very different from either the charge or the mission. So is the proposed bylaw change what you uh, that first? Yeah. So section? so the proposed bylaw definitions um, and I you know this is the current bylaws are is a historical document so I don't know why only uh, gender was. Um, defined under definitions, but if you looked at the proposed bylaw where there's a, a, a definition of human rights, I would suggest that um, that definition be carried forward from the bylaw to the committee charge to the mission statement. Gotcha. And so I'm, I'm very sorry then this is out of order. I see that this new revised definition does not include sexual orientation. Right, I think that, that you had pointed that out so um, bef before, and there was a little bit of discussion about why. Uh, can can I make a motion to just add sexual orientation to that original definition and carry it throughout? Yeah. I actually hadn't noticed it before. I was just confused. Yeah, I didn't as, see yeah it but that, yet. thank you. I second that motion. All in favor? Yes. I. Okay, unanimous. And then in terms of using that definition, both for the bylaw and, sorry, both for the charge and also for the mission. Sounds great. Yeah. All right, so just to clarify, um, the proposed definition of human rights is gonna have an, uh, we're going to add sexual orientation to the list of categories. And then the suggestion will be that that definition be used both for the charge and the mission statement. Yes. Aye. So there was such an emphasis on the gender piece because at the time there wasn't really anything about gender. And there was something that was going on nationally when it was revised the last time where it needed to be put out the different ways because you know year after year we become more progressive to some degree and so i think it was really to bring a broader awareness to gender identities i don't think so, that we had a problem with that i think the other the problem was that it didn't include anybody else right. except for those under gender identity yeah i i think there's so there's uh, there's one other category, and I'm sorry to open up a can of worms, but I think it's an important one for us, and that is civic participation. Um, that it's not included, and we do have a right to to participation in our systems of governance uh, locally, and it's not in that definition, is it? Okay, I'm so I didn't hear you, so I'm civic, sorry. That's why I'm looking a little bit off. Yeah. <laughs> so what's not included in the definition, and I'm sorry, I said I'm sorry to open up a can of worms, is civic participation, and um, you know things like our right to vote and so on. Those are, um, I don't know how strongly people feel about those things, but that's an issue in Amherst right now because. Green card holders, refugees, a whole bunch of people who live in Amherst who are not able to vote in our local elections. So it may be sort of a hot thing to topic to introduce at this point. We have a big agenda, I know that, but it could also be an easy solution. Like in my mind, it's really clear. So I'm just trying so I'm, I'm just trying to 
figure out what it is you're suggesting we do. So maybe- To add civic participation along with the, let me just say this, I'm making a motion to add civic participation along with the other categories to the definition. My and confusion is a second. That my confusion, I second it. And my confusion is that in your definition of civic participation, I think you included um, citizenship status, but that's not. No, I not citizen. You. Just saying that people who live in Amherst should have a right to vote in uh, town elections and participate in town meetings and so on and so forth. And right now they cannot. They cannot vote, so that's why I brought up the voting. People people who are not U.S. citizens may not vote in town elections, and that's unusual. I mean, a lot of towns around the country allow residents to vote. I totally locally. agree with what you want, but I don't understand how it relates to this paragraph because this because is an I'm saying this is an articulation of the basis on which people are protected. So if you added civic participation to that paragraph, what that reads to me is that I can't be discriminated against because I'm on the Human Rights Commission and I say something that annoys someone else, right? That's different way, than yeah, what that's you want, different from what what you I'm want saying. to accomplish. I'm saying, I agree with what you want to accomplish. I'm just saying I don't see how it belongs in this paragraph. I'm saying that this is a paragraph that defines what our human rights are. And we do have a right. I see it as a human right to be able to participate in your government, in your local government. Um, but I don't want to take too much time debating it if there are issues. Um, it's something I do plan to bring up, actually, when we get to our goals. Yeah, and yeah, I agree with that. But then we will have to add refugees and asylum seekers. And there's no, a we're not tactical. adding no, 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 no. We're talking what? about rights, not about yeah, people. Right. I am assuming that you are saying that I cannot be discriminated against because I'm a Democrat, not a Republican or an independent and have the right to vote in any town as opposed to those who do not have the, I don't want to say right because are legal or whatever it is based on their status. I'm thinking that you're protecting those of us who have the right to vote or have the right to have a difference of opinion about certain political town, uh, national statutes, as opposed to those who don't have those rights yet based on their status as immigrant, foreigner, whatever way you want so to put it. Just to clarify, the town of Amherst has actually said that it is fine for residents of Amherst to vote in town elections, but the state of Massachusetts has not approved it. So it's something that if we put it in, we would take up as an advocacy measure, but I, that's why I'm happy leaving it out. I just felt like I should mention it. Let's discuss it in a different forum. And Ronnie, nobody's that. disagreeing with you. I don't think you're hearing what we're saying. We agree with you. I'd love for everyone to have the right to vote, but civic participation as a human right, um, I don't think that's that's the language that's gonna get where, where, us where you want. So I, nobody's saying we don't wanna take it up or that it's so, too, con, you know, it's, or that there's conflict about it. So it is, it is in, um, stated in human rights, um, in other human rights laws, but let's just, my suggestion is that it should be there because it's a human right. But if people disagree that it should be there, then, you know. I don't think we're disagreeing that it's a human right. I think we're disagreeing on who, based on the laws of Massachusetts, has that right or right. something like that. This is a list of who gets access. So in order mm. to achieve what you want to achieve, it would have to say something like um, non-citizens, 
right? This is this says if you're queer, you get to vote. If you're black, you get to vote. If you're Jewish, you get to vote. So we would oh, add if you're not you're a saying. citizen, okay. you get to vote. Okay. Civic participation. Yeah, that's the category so then, in which the right is applied. Right. Okay. I do I think as a right, but I do think that um also right now um us all of the document is pretty consistent in that it doesn't define specifically what rights we're protecting. Instead, it mm -hmm. points to other sources. The definitions gives the broadest possible explanation of rights that um, we have simply because we exist as human beings. The remainder of the documents um, defer the question of what rights we're supposed to protect to local commonwealth or federal law. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the right to civic participation, which is very poorly protected under federal law, right. if at all. I mean, our constitution was never properly amended to, we don't even elect our president directly. Like, um, so, okay. yeah. Um, um, okay. But, I focused on the part that just said these rights are um, inherent to us all, but that is fine. I'm withdrawing my request. And Let's I think Ron, um, Pamela has a, so um, I think that the current definition, which is an attempt to list uh, human rights very broadly, uh, could include um, some language around civic participation. So I pulled up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and uh, they actually have three statements in the document. Um, and so it might be worthwhile to think a little bit about how it could be included, but um, Article 21 st states, everyone has the right to take part in the government of his country directly or through freely chosen representative. Art uh, uh, subclause two, everyone has the right to equal access to public service in his country. And the last one, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government, and this shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures. So I do think that there is room for civic part participation, perhaps just a little bit more thought about that term, um, uh, how to term it. But um, I, I feel I would say that it's an appropriate place for in that first um, paragraph. So I just thought in my head, the I think our stuck place was resident versus legal by defined by federal law or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts legal resident. So a uh, citizen, that's where I think we got stuck. Yeah, so I don't know that, um, that, the, that uh, Ronnie in her first motion mention anything other than civic participation. Did you list, because uh, the definition as it's currently proposed uh, doesn't include that. It just says human rights. So I, this is how I would envision that paragraph. Human rights are those rights we have simply because we exist as human beings. They are not guaranteed by any state these universal rights are inherent to us all, regardless of nationality, sex, gender, sexual orientation, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, language, um, or other status. They range from the most fundamental, the right to life, to those that make life worth living, such as the right to food, education, work, health, civic participation, and liberty. So I think you could make make that um, yeah. addition without there being any reference to uh, uh, citizenship or immigration status. I agree. It, it does belong um, in terms of grammatical consistency in that's, that last sentence. I guess I'm concerned about civic participation. If we want to talk about voting, then we should say voting, because civic participation could be the right to go to a town square and speak your mind, or write a letter to the editor, or, you know, convene a march. And I don't want to mm, have confusion about it. I'm happy to say, vote, <laughs> be, be part of the democratic process, or whatever you want to say. I'm open to other thoughts, because is there something wrong with 
leading a demonstration in town if you're not uh, do you have to be a citizen to do that no 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 ronnie ronnie so, i agree 100 percent with you please stop looking for ways you think i disagree i want to start uh, there i agree 100 percent. i'm trying to secure what you want the word civic participation to me does not say voting what, what does to you you want to say voting yeah I mean, I, I don't want to limit. I want to have the full expanse of what you want uh, be unequivocally understood. To me, voting is limited. It's limited to a very specific thing. Civic participation is broader. Um, so I chose the broader option, but I'm, I'll go with voting if that's what, that's the current preference. I think that what yeah. Pamela but it's, read is what we should be adopting and just leave it at that. I'm sorry, what? Pamela read what something Pamela that read? added civic participation that does include voting, that does include demonstration, that does include free speech, that does include all of those things that we keep going back and forth about, but we're all again on the same page saying it differently. Yeah, so Pamela, could you repeat what you read? Human rights are, the, are rights we have simply because we exist as human beings. They are not guaranteed by any state. These universal rights are inherent to us all, regardless of nationality, sex, gender, identity. Sorry to interrupt. You're reading what we have here. I, I think it was what you drew you from the universal. It's, it's getting there? OK. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, these universal rights are inherent to us all, regardless of nationality, sex, gender, sexual orientation, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, language, or any other status. They range from the most fundamental, the right to life, to those that make life worth living, such as the rights to food, education, work, health, civic participation, and liberty. That just says the word civic participation. When you said that uh, Pamela captured it, I what I went back to is what you read from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I'm not going to um, object to the use of the phrase civic participation. I just find it vague. And oh, I oh, you find it vague. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here's one thing that I would offer. So I think that this definition is meant to be very broad and, in, and encompass a lot. It's simply an example, right? So um, it doesn't state every category, um, which is why you have, they range from the most fundamental to, uh, and I think by, uh, I would agree with Ronnie that using civic participation is, uh, as a broad term is probably uh, wiser than using voting as a specific term because of the state and federal uh, laws that would encompass who can, who's, who's eligible to vote and who's not. So by saying civic participation, you avoid that um, because everyone has a right to civic participation and it might vary by class depending on whether you're a citizen or a non-citizen or some state some cities as she pointed out allow non-citizens uh, to vote others do not but if you use the broader term you've you there's an avenue for people to 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 have discussion about all of those specific things if you look at it a little differently we have a right to food we have a right to shelter. So if you take a look at, we have a right to food, according to certain folks, we're supposed to have three meals a day plus two snacks, but it doesn't say we have a right to three square meals a day and plus two snacks. It says we have a right to food. I think that's the difference in what each of us are struggling with. All right, so you're you're going to entertain a motion to to make that final, yes. or or was it the motion was made? Is there a second to add civic participation to the definition? I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? I'm assuming no. we had discussion. I see six 
hands and we have six members, so motion passes. Opposed, I guess no need to ask. All right, so we are um, up to the complaint process and um, and then we'll, we'll um, hopefully we will we'll, um, have a working lunch as we talk about cultural events. And I'll have to dash out to pick up lunch in a few minutes. Um, so there, um, there's no document in your package that uh, details the complaint process. Um, because the process has not been formally formally written before, and I, um, uh, Jennifer and I can explain what has happened traditionally. So, the complaint process: complaints come by come in by phone, walk in, e um, email, or online. So anyone can make a complaint to the commission by basically any method. Um, generally, uh, Jennifer and I will. Uh, connect with the person who's made the complaint, the complainant, um, ask them um, to come in and meet with us for, for further, um, to gather further information that we have a, uh, an in-person meeting with them. Um, uh, we may take a statement and additional information will have, they will have an opportunity to review that statement to make sure that we've captured the information correctly. Uh, we'll investigate the allegations that are um, that are alleged, which means that we're going to speak with all of the parties. Um, the best example or most recent example would be to to think about the complaint that we received from a member of the community last year, um, alleging that the town's uh, building inspector had um, had taken actions that were based on racial discrimination. So we spoke with all of the parties involved. So the named parties, uh, the person who brought the complaint, um, everyone, the person who was alleged to have done the wrongdoing, and then all of the peripheral parties, right? Because there were other folks who were involved. Um, through that process, we took statements from everyone. Uh, they were summarized and sent to them for further review or for clarification. You know, did did we hear the information that you reported to us correctly? Um, and they had an opportunity to correct any um, misstatements that we had made. In that case, we also actually went um, sought expertise from outside of the town. So that case uh, involved whether um, a ramp. Um, in two different locations in town, met the requirements of the Massachusetts Office of Disability. So an MOD representative came out, saw both locations, spoke with both parties, got further, uh, we got gathered further information from, from, from the MOD rep. And then based on all of that information, we then come to a conclusion about whether we think that there has been any wrongdoing and what then asked uh, the parties to um, to enter into a voluntary mediation, right? Because we can't necessarily take action against anyone. In that case, um, um, the one of the parties, the parties were not uh, interested in voluntary mediation and they decided to per pursue other uh, avenues. Um, so, uh, the conclusion of the, of the investigation was that, um, there was no discrimination and that actually was based on a lot of, a lot of material based on the conversations, based on, uh, on, um, documents that had been submitted into the building instructor and the history of interactions between the, the building instructor and the parties. Um, so, I mean, that one was certainly, I would say a rather complex uh, case with lots of like different information from different sources, but the end result is that, you know, we as a body, this body or the HR, the human rights director, can adjudicate a case. We can make um, suggestions. We can ask people to 
enter into a voluntary um, mediation. But um, if they choose not to do that, um, then there's very little that we can do. There were some suggestions made um, to the town about how they might approach the work that they do differently for the future. Um, some and again, you know, not as a body can't order folks to do it, but we can at least provide some in insight. Um, and can I ask a question about that. I wonder if. Um... You know, if you're the complainant and it's been determined that your rights have not been violated, then you're going to be less inclined to participate in some kind of mediation, right? What's the incentive to actually participate in mediation if it's been decided that you have there hasn't been a violation? So I, I think it, it, there in this case, and this one was very unusual, right? And that the allegation that was brought was not by, brought by the party who was alleged to have been discriminated against. So a, an, I would say a third party. So your motivation could be for a positive change to prevent it. Like you, you, this, the person who brought the complaint um, did not have a direct relationship to the action because in the way that the bylaw is written, anyone can bring a complaint to the commission to allege um, any wrongdoing. So there's there would there would not have been a remedy for that individual if we had found discrimination. I think um, had there been, you know, so, yeah. I have a question also. I actually think that the um, that the strongest resource that we have is the right uh, is the resource of referral, right? Um, referring people to MCAD or other state agencies, making them aware of um, what rights they have and other avenues for pursuing their complaints is what really the human rights director can do best. Um, this will come up in the later discussion for when, when we talk about cultural and other events, but there was um, one of the events that we have planned for December for the community is a Know Your Rights event where um, the Mass Commission Against Discrimination has uh, volunteered to come and do an evening presentation and they will provide uh, a bilingual tra translation for that. So. Informing, I think the educational piece is where uh, I think that this commission has the um, has the has is an area of growth for this commission and where you can have the biggest impact because there is just no adjudicatory power. In the, in the case with the building inspector, there is probably more of an opportunity to see change, right? Because it's one town department informing another town department and the town manager about um, systems or policies or procedures that we think that they might be able to do differently. But if it's external to the town, you know, there's, there is absolutely, you know, no authority for me uh, to have over any private business or one of the colleges or, you know, we can make these recommendations, but there's, there's very little power behind the suggestions. Did the town make any changes that, that were recommended by the DEI? So uh, to be honest, I don't know. I'd have to ask. The question I have is, given that we are a regional school district, do the other three entities have access to human rights within their towns? Or are we just Amherst or do we also oversee Levitt, Pelham, Shootsbury? So the way that the bylaw is written, anyone 
right, who was within the town of Amherst. So a student, if they lived in one of the other communities but attended Amherst public schools, that student or parent could take advantage of uh, of the Human Rights Commission because the action occurred in the town of Amherst. So only if it if it occurred in Amherst, not if it occurred in Shutesbury or Leverett. Okay. Most of the cities and towns in Massachusetts have a human rights commissions. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know specifically about Shutesbury or Leverett, but almost all of the cities and towns have um, some so human rights commission or board. Very interesting. Have, uh, another oh, no, question no. regarding this: uh, Is there any? Uh, has there been any incident where the town had to pay and you know pay off somebody? for their uh, grievances, they're, they're sued and so on. I am just curious. So that have come through the Human Rights Commission? Because I mean, I think the answer to your broad question is has the town ever settled any complaints would be yes. Um, I don't know of um, complaints that have been settled that have been brought to the attention of the Human Rights Commission. But again, my knowledge is limited to the last year. So this is, we just received um, information from Barnstable for their second um, invitation for us to participate in one of their human rights um, forums. I'll call it a forum. Um, do we ever interface with um, specifically um, Leverett, Pelham and Shutesbury? And I'm only asking for them because of our regional school districts. So I have not, um, but I think that's a, a poss that, that, you know, that's certainly a possibility. In the last year, the, uh, the only other, um, well, I'll, I'll say this. So there is a Massachusetts DEI co um, coalition. So diversity and equity directors from around the Commonwealth have formed a coalition. And through that coalition, we get, I get lots of information about different activities around the state to share out. So we're connected through them. We've had some conversations with the DEI director in Springfield and the DEI director in Pittsfield. There, are, I don't know of other specific DEI directors in the Western Massachusetts. Um, in in addition, the other uh, board that has had that has reached out to um, to addition to to collaborate with additional um, communities are the Disability Access and Advisory Committee. And they have done some work with the Northampton, their Northampton counterpart, but certainly that's something that, you know, the commission could pursue. Thank you. And Jennifer had her hand up before Jacinta came in. And I will also, before Jennifer speaks, welcome Jacinta to our meeting. Yes, welcome Jacinta. I would just say that we have not had a lot of connection with any of the human rights commissions. I don't know that Leverett and Shutesbury have their own or not. I know that we've had connections with Northampton's human rights commission in the past. Um, and I don't know about locally about the other one towns either like South Hadley or Grand Bay. Well, the only reason why I'm asking is because I remember when we did our, um, when we did our joint meeting for fair housing affordable housing with, um, we invited, we put our flyers in our schools, which meant that folks from Leverett and Pelham and Shrewsbury were then informed that we were having this. So that's why I was specifically interested in those three because of our regional schools. Um, any I'm sorry, I thought I had it pressed. As we're um, looking at formalizing the procedural uh, uh, complaint process, um, that would also include formalizing or documenting the complaint process so that there would be um, public facing information about what people can expect when they file a complaint. And 
Any other questions about our complaint process? Yeah, I would like to know uh, how long will this take, this, uh, you know, formulating uh, process and the complaint process? So there was a lot of work done on that last year, and I actually um, uh, included at the last retreat some suggestions for what a complaint process might look like. I, I think, I, you know, we could certainly put that information back on the ag your agenda and, and um, you could, you know, vote up or down whether you're interested in or making changes. So. That'll be good. That'll be excellent. It'll be so nice. Yeah, I would appreciate that as well. And it sounds like from our earlier discussion, we added to this, which is that when a complaint is filed, um, you will, part of the process is to contact the co-chairs, right? Because um, I didn't hear you articulate. So okay. it's uh, 12, uh, five after 12. So I um, might suggest that you have um, begin your working lunch while I go to pick up your lunch. So there, and your working lunch is another activity to get to know each other, which is um, a bingo card. So I will distribute that. And while, um, while you guys are working on your bingo card, I will go and actually pick up your, <laughs> your lunch. Do we go offline during lunch or no? And uh, is there anybody? Here? Not if it's a working if lunch. We have a working lunch. We have to stay online. Is there anyone here? There's no one in the audience. Just remember this is being recorded. I'm the only one that can't be seen. So since I don't know how bingo is played, what am I supposed to do with this? I haven't seen them yet. So you, I think you have to fill up Advent Creative Software. What do you mean I fill it up? So um, what is, the object of bingo is to um, create, to go and creating, creating a, um, to cover a square either um, vertically, horizontal, or at a diagonal. So um, in each of your squares, there's a little, there's basically um, a, something, so you need to find someone with that attribute. So for ex mm -hmm. example, one of my squares says, has been on television. So in conversation amongst yourselves, you would find someone who in has been on TV okay. and then you would um, cross off that square. So it's going to require that you're up and around and moving and talking to the other members of the oh, commission. Okay. Yeah, it's an opportunity to get you out of your seat since you've been seating for like, you know, several hours.
So I um, hope that everyone's had a, uh, learned something additional about the uh, other members of the commission through the bingo activity and got a, uh, another opportunity just to learn a little bit about yourselves. Um, the next thing on the agenda is the um, cultural events. Um, and so Jennifer has put on the screen the major events that we have planned for this year. Um, So there's an um, MLK celebration, um, and you should be able to see it from your, uh, we'll check a Lunar New Year. We'll try, um, which we did not, we were unsuccessful last year in doing a Women's History Month um, event. Uh, autism awareness. These are these not we haven't committed to each and all of these events, but these were the lists that we came up with. There's International Transgender Day, Autism Awareness, Earth Day, which is a town wide cleanup, Arab American Heritage Month, AAPI, LGBTQIA plus Pride Month, and we will have a celebration of marriage equality. Um, the Youth Hero Awards, uh, Juneteenth, and an Immigrant Heritage Month, World Relief. And then um, the Frederick Douglass reading, which many of you participated in last year. Um, there's a Women's Equality Day, Hispanic Heritage, um, Indigenous Peoples Day, which is tomorrow, um, Human Rights Day, and Kwanzaa. So, um, this was a list of cultural events that we that the commission sort of looked at last year, and we Jennifer and I worked out what we thought would be um, a budget to support the majority of the events. And so, while I, I you should know that we do not have twenty two thousand dollars <laughs> in our budget, the events have been um, primarily supported through um, some funds in the DEI office, some funds through the HRC has a friends account, um, and then um, support from uh, nonprofits and businesses uh, around town. So for the example, for the Latinx Heritage event, if you um, were present for that event, you would have seen on the, on the flyer um, support from Amherst College, Kuhn Riddle, um, Amherst uh, Rec Department, DEI, and I know that I'm missing um, another agency or another uh, company that provided support for that event. I know that Ronnie and I and you have been meeting with um, Becky Demling to support Festival of Lights. Yes. And so was that on there for our... This um, list was created before we took that on, but that will definitely be a cultural event that the HRC and the DEI office will support, and the date for that is scheduled for November 19th, I believe. And does everybody Sunday. know what that means? So Diwali is the Festival of Lights. It's a Hindu festival, but is really pretty much celebrated in many countries around the world because it's about lights and good food and lots of food. And it's also about good winning over evil. So one of the great things about Diwali is all the stories that are in different cultures and each story is something exotic, but um, it's always where, the, where good overcomes evil. Good is small, evil is big and ugly, and then, but then good beats evil. So 
can I tell you quickly the story like where I grew up, the Diwali story? So there's this giant named Maisheshwara. We lived in a town that was called Mysore. Maisheshwara is the giant. Maisheshwara would go outside, come to town every day or every week or something on a regular basis and claim the first son from the family. So nobody could kill Maisheshwara because if he spilled a drop of blood, it would turn into a thousand soldiers and they would destroy you. So these two, this one woman did not want to give up her child. So she and her sister came up with a plan to take, get rid of my Sheshwara. And so when he came to get their child, one of the women cut his, slit his throat or cut his wrist or cut some part of his body. And as the blood was coming out, the other woman drank it up before it could be converted into soldiers. <laughs> and that's how um, and my Sheshwara fell. And so there are these hills outside the town of Mysore that if you s extended your imagination could be the humongous body of a dead person. Um, and so that's supposed to be my Sheshwara's body. And so Diwali is the celebration of overcoming. The town celebrated because my Sheshwara was finally gone and he wasn't stealing all the children from the town. So this is just one, there are like hundreds of these stories so it's always something, even when I was in Trinidad working one time, they had their own stories and they were celebrating Diwali. So it's just a great festival that has all good things about it. So Sorry one of the that. things that we've, oh, I... it was. So one of the things that we've um, tried to do this year is um, include, so we were asked by one of the town councilors to take on the Festival of Lights, which is an event that she had done in the past. And another counselor actually asked us to take on the marriage equality event. So we're gonna take on those two events, um, but we are definitely putting on events on a shoestring non-existent budget. And one of the things that I thought that would have made it to the agenda, but didn't is a discussion about um, the ability for the commission to do some fundraising through the friends account. So the friends account, like the Jones Library friends group, is an account that allows support for the work of this body that's um, outside of the town's appropriation um, for the for the body or for the for the work. And at some point, probably not during this uh, meeting we should have a more in-depth conversation about what activities um, can happen to support the friends account and how we can start to build up some um, financial resources to support this work because uh, you know to do it right it is quite expensive and we don't currently have um, the resources to do it in the report that Philip um, presented to the town council at the end of the year. He did um, request financial support for the HRC, but I do not believe that that um, was responded to. The town is just beginning to um, start its uh, process of budgeting for the next fiscal year, because that happens in the fall and the decisions are made in the spring. So one consideration will be to make sure that you're looped into that process to, um, to see if there's a possibility of obtaining some funds to do to do this event. Um, and I think um, my thoughts are, and um, other people may think differently, that it's going to require a collaboration between um, the town appropriation, if we can get one, um, and um, working with a nonprofits and other businesses who would who would support the activities, uh, the cultural events and activities that are being promoted um, throughout the town. Yeah, I have a, actually concern that uh, in the town right now, people and the communities are very much involved in the Truth and Healing Commission on you know Indian boarding school policies in the U.S. because it ties to the. Uh, right now to the holiday also and it is very local and i i would have assumed that we would have done something and raised awareness or because we do have a 
Human Rights Commission does play a part in it. And it shows that we feel for them also, the indigenous people. So, and you know, we could have identified with the legal experts and organizations who are doing it or initiated some kind of contact with the, uh, through emails or these organizations who are involved with indigenous uh, rights. And we should have done some uh, thing that would have showed that we are also concerned and we are part of the, and that is the whole point of us being here because we want to be reflecting what the community is uh, right now doing. I have a question and a thought. The question is, I see the $22,750 um, budget number. And I heard you say that we don't have, that's more money than there is. Is Has any money been budgeted this year? I, heard, I also heard you say appropriations are upcoming for next year, so. So I, um, I don't believe there were any appropriations made for this current fiscal year for the HRC. So and, where did where did the money to, for the yeah. cultural events come from? Um, so to Jennifer's credit, she has been able to fundraise and get support for these events. And we were able also to use some DEI funds, but um, the uh, one of the biggest challenge for the cultural events is that these events generally are a celebration that includes uh, food and the state procurement laws for um, buying uh, food and beverages are very strict. So um, to the extent that we're able to build capacity, financial capacity through the friends account, then it makes it easier um, to do to do those uh, celebrations. Um, the other thing that you should know is that, and Jennifer will be able to provide like the dates, but um, Representative Mindy Dom um, did earmark some funds for community engagement, which we think can be used um, for some of the cultural uh, cultural events. So forgive me because um, as you all know, I'm relatively new. Um, I, my question, which might be considered somewhat um, provocative or problematic is if there is no funding for this, why is there such a priority on it? Why are there so many events happening? Um, unfunded priorities are very problematic in governmental operations. Attached to that, I would say, in terms of supporting in uh, different distinct demographic communities, there are other things we can do that I think might have great value. Like I testified in support of making what is now called Columbus Day Indigenous Peoples Day. And I did it as an individual, but boy, what I would, and I would have done it and I did it without the Human Rights Commission imprimatur. But I would rather have been able to say, I'm Rabbi Deborah Kolodny and I'm and I'm a member of the Amherst Human Rights Commission, which of course I didn't say because it wasn't something that we had discussed and that we agreed to. There's a lot we can do to get um, the message out, the support out that might actually have a concrete impact on the constituents that we are um, concerned about. So um, I guess I want to put on the table, is cultural events the only thing we're doing that's affirmative? And if it's unfunded, why is that the case? Can so I just step in? So I don't think it needs to be the only thing because I think in order to create an inclusive community that we will need more than just community events per se or cultural events. I think you have to hit it through different genres, if I would say, I would say what I will say about the cultural events is when we had our first Latinx, our first AAPI, our first Lunar New Year, the response from the community was, this is the first time I feel recognized by the town of Amherst, right? And when we have Juneteenth, it's so big and it's on the common that it pulls people who don't necessarily know what Juneteenth is to the event. And so it was, it's one way, it's not the only way. Local government is tricky with funds. So the $22,750 budget that you see up there is like best case scenario. If we could have all the funds that we wanted, can we do this? Can we do it that way? Right? I understand. I would just say if, if there's an un, if something's not funded, starting from a premise of we'd like to do 11 things, seems like 
more of a stretch than necessary. If we had five events and, you know, had that as our goal and had the amount of money it would take to, to fund those five events as a fundraising goal, personally, I'd feel more comfortable, you know, to start from absolutely zero and ask the, uh, this commission to join Jennifer in finding the funds just seems like more of a stretch. And I will also just confess that I didn't come on to this commission to raise money for cultural events. I came on to support the human rights needs of the community. I love them. I, I'm not saying we should stop them. I'm just saying, why 11? Why, you know, yeah, Juneteenth was unbelievable. We shouldn't stop that. You know, so can we prioritize them? I mean, I think that you guys can prioritize, which if you want to bring them, knock them down to what you would like to see and the amount that you would like to see. I, and, do, uh, I do think that we need to discuss the list and then yeah. among ourselves take a decision, maybe in terms of what our priorities are, in terms of how involved we'll be in this versus education about what's human rights or... Yeah. Uh, um, how do we communicate to get more people who are facing violations to speak up or I don't know what, but I think there's a trade-off there. But I also am curious because I get the sense that these things, you guys, DEI is really doing the work for all of this. In the time that I've been involved, there have been three or four events and I don't think we did anything. Yeah. I mean, there was, we came and supported, yes. Members of the yeah. commission were there to help serve food or clean up or do this or do that. But in terms of the organization of it, it was DEI that did it. So one question I have, and it does make sense that this is something that's a total fit with DEI. Um, one question I have is about why you don't take the lead on it more publicly and have us be sort of as sisters and just one Can last I just... thought on this coming up to Diwali. One of the things that really struck me about the Diwali discussion that made me open to it was that the town councilor who brought it to us immediately rattled off local associations that were willing to fund it and support it. And she said, in fact, last year they had more money than they needed. So it was something that seemed like an easy yes. It's a fun event. It draws a whole bunch of people of different nationalities uh, it's a place to raise the profile of the Human Rights Commission, and it's already funded. So that's part of what made it appealing to mm -hmm. me. So I would say first, prior to the DEI department's only been here since January of 2022. So in oh. the past, in order to make these events happen, I had to tunnel or channel them through a committee. And so it was the Human Rights mm -hmm. Commission made the most sense to do that too. Uh, okay. um, and the the notion behind them was just to do them and do them well enough so that people look forward to them every year, right? And so they do. I don't have a problem if you guys don't want, if you guys want to prioritize a certain amount, it's going to be very hard to prioritize or to say HRC will do these five and then the DEI department will do these six. However that works, I'm not quite sure. I don't know that Pamela wants to take that on under just us. And I would say that there's been a mix of people who have contributed to the different events over the years, depending on who is part of the Human Rights Commission. So last year, Victor Cruz, who was a high school student, and Philip created the Latinx Heritage Month celebration, right? They they owned that. And so I typically do try, usually there's a proclamation associated with it. So we try to have community members from that culture represented in, in there and have them help us create the event itself. And then Liz, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to expand on what Jennifer said. Um, because of the people that were on the committee last year, and because of the folks in the town that don't know who we are, these cultural events brought people to us, therefore making us more accessible mm. to the overall community of Amherst, not just the folks who know about town council and what they do and cannot do for them. It made those who look more like us um, aware that they had certain rights. There was intermingling, there was community, and it was important to the people of the town that were underrepresented to know that they had a place to go 
when there was an issue, which is why I think some of these events are um, important. I also know that we had a group of people on the committee last year that were instrumental. We all took one of the events and we all led one of the events. So it wasn't that, um, you know, we was doing all of this willy nilly. There was some um, discussion about which ones we were gonna do. And we had um, high school students that were gung ho. We had young people, we had older people that helped. Jennifer does a lot of work behind the scenes. I do a lot of work behind the scenes. Sometimes when I couldn't be leading, I would meet with Jennifer and we would do the gist, if you will. So it wasn't just that you, you know, the question was, why are these so important? They are important because it shows the folks that are underrepresented that there's a place to be, a place to go, and a place to feel important to the town. And that's why these are important. Um, should we do 11 or 12, which is one a month or two a month or three a month? Probably not. However, do not think that these are not important to the people who look like me in this town because yeah. they are very important to the people that look like me in this town. Okay. Totally agree. And I cannot overemphasize the fact that these events are very important. And the fact that it's been just a year, less than a year, and you have started, uh, you know, found ways of finding it and organizing it. I really enjoyed it. But my, uh, um, I guess, suggestion is that um, we need to amplify their impact. Basically, as uh, you know, my experience also, we need to get this because we are the stakeholders in it. So if we somehow amplify it and create the uh, importance of our uh, mission also do, uh, through those um, events so that we can, and the civil society groups can come in and the um, non-governmental organizations uh, also partake in those events so if it becomes bigger as you know um, because the last one that we attended was the latin uh, latina x and we, there was uh, you could see that we had a limitation we cannot do more than that because we don't have the resources so if we involve other organizations and get the resources that like rani said about diwali you know that you know the counselor came and she was totally confident that she, they can get the resources so if we play a part in getting that because we need to amplify our uh, importance in there so people who identify as you're saying also they see that they are important people in the community and they need help when they need help they know where to go and how to uh, get the complaints in. So if we have a, a, comp a complaint process also clear at that time, when the events are happening, we have forms ready, we have all these handout ready and all that. So we are all there for them also. Can I just add one more thing? Yeah. Um, if you look at that, it would look like that's all we did. However, there was a bunch of us that did other things as well. So Philip and I met once a week for months with members of the health department and um, the CSSJC. And we tackled um, and put together a forum for fair housing where we had folks come in and talk about their experiences with housing in Amherst and things like that. So there's so many other things that were, that happened other than just, and I don't wanna say just because that just means that it's not important, but we had cultural events. We also had a lot of work on some other things as well as we had seven complaints that we had to, well, more than seven, but we had seven that we had to um, vet, if you will. So um, sometimes it might be um, a dull undertaking and other times it's gonna be very active. So um, we are important. We just need to continue to make ourselves known to the folks of the town so that they know that they have a place. I mean, and I, I think another part of it, I'm also a community participation officer, which means that I work on trying to bridge the community to local government. So what I can say from <clears throat> my knowledge and learned experience from doing that, and as a person who lived in the town of Amherst for 
30 some years before becoming an employee is that there's a lack of trust, right? And so you can't always just show up somewhere and expect this large crowd, right? And so one of the things that has, you know, since we've gotten bigger with most of these events and now's the time to invite in those other entities and the other local, you know, the other departments in town, because now there's a little bit of more trust there where we can do that, right? So everything is somewhat purposefully done the way that it is, right? Because there is this really lack of trust, right? And so part of bridging that is, is through these events that does help because when people feel recognized, that's one of the first ways to get them to the table. Because at the end of the day, for me, it is really to to increase the participation from those who we don't see at the table, right? And so I think that they, these events do help with that, but there's also lots of ways, but it's also very hard to get deep into the community where the people who are affected the most by the rules and regulations and policies that are created through town are affected by. I guess yeah. like uh, one more thing I just want to add to that question is like from what looked like on the document, there was only like like six or so that didn't seem like they needed funding. Um, and so I guess like the ones that actually do have the funding, like that question would apply more to of kind of like we don't we don't necessarily have the funds, but I guess it does help like having come from a position of like not knowing how this commission operates at all. Um, to hear that this is like a channel for sort of like commit like um community members to come and seek out resources um or have us help them point them in the direction to those resources to host these community events that's interesting but yeah so I see and I went to the Frederick Douglass one and that one didn't seem like it required anything other than like little snacks um but yep. it was super like fun and I got to meet everybody so I do like that um, the commission does have events that aren't necessarily overly funded or necessarily a cultural event that has to have a lot of um, posters or anything X, Y, Z like that. Um, there are some, and then there's lots of, um, so there, like, for instance, there's, there's, there are organizations that do celebrate specific things and we can try to link like there used to be the MLK breakfast I don't really have a good understanding of what's going on with that but when that was starting to you know after the, they haven't had the breakfast since since um the pandemic but that was done a, a grassroots organization all on its own and then we here at the town had a proclamation that we would write, read every year and what it meant was the town council and like maybe three or four residents community members would go and then the council would read this proclamation and I was like well I think we could do a little bit more than just that proclamation right just to support and to enhance what's going on because as a town even not everyone might agree with me but I feel like as a town we have an obligation to celebrate and to honor the cultures that are within our community that we're aware of and as they come up and to include them and so some of these and again, this budget here is like, oh, if I could have every possible dollar that I wanted to fund here, that's what this is. This is not like an actual spend, as well as there were a few that have zero balances because we didn't know if we would celebrate them or not. But like. That's usually, yeah, that's usually done by the community participation officer. So that doesn't necessarily, is that on here? Yeah, that doesn't necessarily need to be on here. That's done through the CPOs. We should still do that. And just because it happens around oh, it happens so, around Earth Day. That's yeah. why. So here's the other thing. Um, we are not stuck on any of these cultural events. I just want to put that out there as well. Um, there are other things that we do to make ourselves accessible. We had a table at the at the um, block party. We haven't had a table at the block party before, but that came from us saying, hey, or I asked a question last year, hey, this person had a table. How come we don't have a table? Yep. So just little things like that where we can, if we, we have to, if it, we don't have to do any or, or all of these actually, but we need to be able to get out into the community and let the community know who we are and let the community know that they are important to us as a town as well. And I think that's part of our charge. Yeah. 
plenty of other community events that happen outside of the town where people can table at as well, HRC can table. So Liz, actually, you spoke to one of the things that was top of my mind, which is I totally agree with the outreach uh, need. And I think we should do an inventory of what all the events are that are happening and see where we can get a table and have access to people. That's number one. Number two, since I came on, I've been to every event and I haven't always seen a table. And I have certainly haven't seen a table that had a handout with here's the human rights complaint process, you know, and here's the phone number that you call or here's the email that you write to. So if that's the goal, we need to get our act together on making sure that we're we're maximizing the use, you know, of these events, whether other people are hosting them or we're hosting them. And I just I want, you know, we can have a hundred events. I'm just saying if it's not funded you know, to have the Human Rights Commission be the entity that's supposed to fundraise for it. It's like, everything I just heard, this is an argument to the town council to fund these things. You know, I agree. This should be something the city takes seriously. And that means that the city should put their money where their mouth is, or the town, sorry. I am so glad you said that because Lynn Greshemaya, I think she attended every single one and she commented at the Frederick Douglass reading how when, when you know that was last Phillips last official event and she commented on how the council with under his leadership was able to bring all of these events um to fruition and for and how important she felt they were so that was a good segue because I was going to think about saying that too okay I know you just have to remember, though, that the problem with budget, it's harder. They probably have to have special legislation and go through a process in order because the we cannot spend the taxpayers dollars on food, which is why we have the HRC gift fund, which I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that you guys should go out fundraising. Right. I would say if you know particular organizations that would be interested in supporting then that might be different. But I'm fine doing it as for now but the other part of it was either a friends group or a what was the other one Pamela uh, so I um looked into two legal options for providing funds to the group so either through um some sort of a trust account or um through the friends group and there are legal arguments for both there is um and I'm gonna forget the proper legal name, but there is a mechanism in the state for um, municipalities to actively fundraise for specific purposes. Most of the time that's done for around affordable housing. Um, and before he left, uh, Sean Mangano shared a document that he had created for the school department uh, for school uh, em employees, uh, for teachers and specifically to fundraise for activities. So there is a way of doing it, but we, you know, we need to um, have it finalized and then have people engage in, um, in the process. I hear you on they are not being able to fund food, but that's not the only cost, I would assume. Like there are people who come to perform at the but at they team. can't fund they don't fund them either. If there's nothing that can be funded by the town in this budget, then again, I I'll just say I'm not gonna participate in fundraising. Maybe that's the way I'll say it. Yeah. I didn't I, I didn't join this commission to do that work. There's so much else that I want to do. Um and I'd like us, I love what you said, Liz, about this isn't the only thing we're doing. And I'd love a calendar of all the things that, you know, we are doing, um, cultural events and other events. And some of us will, you know, prioritize this and some of us will prioritize that. I'll come to the events. But um, yeah, I just don't see that. Yeah. As my I, I I get, I, if I get that. I have another idea also by, you know, uh, we can always uh, include the um, churches and um, the centers, the religious institutions, hospitals, and put our handouts over there and with a little bit of a donation. And this way, there's this two things happening this way. First, they are getting the awareness that there's somebody out there in the town of Amherst, HRC, who's looking after you. And we, we get into, into these areas, those points where the um, uh, participants or community is going anyways. So they see us and at the time of need, they can call us and the um, and they can donate also. When they see that we are effective and people will, they're actually looking for HRC 
you know, human rights. Everybody is looking for us. It's not that we don't have a need in the community. I'd like to move that we discuss money at the end. And at the end, you know, I think we need to get our program priorities in order and let's deal with the money part at the end, if that's okay. Because I'd like to get through the section where we talk about what our goals are for next year. And so, all the stuff that's before that. So I'm proposing, I'm moving to wait for the money discussion till the end. So on the calendar of events as well, um, I'm not sure if all our proclamations are listed there. We do flag raising for Pride Month. We do a flag raising for Black History Month. We do a proclamation for Martin Luther King Day. So not all of these things are money making things. We do a charge in December where we all gather at the town at the town common in the freezing cold and read our proclamation for the year. It was a proclamation or the bylaws, the declarations, and all of us, if we can be there, should be there where you went to coat because it's cold. Um, so there's other things that we do. And if we bring other people to some of those things, um, you know, there's this event going on or the flag raising for Black History Month, we did right on the town common. It We had hot chocolate because it was cold. My gospel choir sang at it. Um, we raised the flag and it wasn't a huge thing. It cost a bunch of hot chocolate and that was about it. Um, and that so came those from are the kind pit. of things that if people, if I'm coming and I bring three people with me and you bring three people with you and you, you know, then we have more than that was there last year. So there's other things that we do and the town council's there. They read the proclamation and we raise the flag and it's, it's great. Um, a lot of people don't know about it. A lot of people don't want to be outside in February, but <laughs> it's it's another thing that we do that's not on here that costs no money that makes people aware of who we are. So one thing that I would I'm sorry to in interrupt you, but I was one thing that I think Philip did very well last year is um, prior to the start of each event, he talked a little bit about the role of the HRC, and so even the, uh, well I won't say that. The cultural art events are an opportunity to talk about what you might consider the more substantive work. So they actually go hand in hand. Um, I would sort of uh, make a note to myself that um, having a brochure, it's really interesting. So I think this is one of the areas where um, I'll just say for myself, like for my generation, having a brochure and having that public is would be something that I would think is really important for um, other generations. Having a brochure is not really um, the way that you communicate the information. And uh, we have some hopes of enhancing perhaps the website so that people have um, an opportunity. I think it needs to be updated anyway. Um, and so that might be another way of having um, a QR code or something that like, you know, that brings in people from a variety of different, so some paper products, some QR codes so that you can share the, the information. I started to laugh because that's what I was going to say. Um, so <laughs> having both options there. I also would just say, because we're not going to talk about money till later, in addition to the other stuff that we are doing, like I know that there was an event for Jewish History Month in March because my colleague, Benjamin, Rabbi Benjamin spoke at it, but it's not on this list. That's because- The council, oh, the, the, the counselors brought that forward. All right. Yeah. So if we could have a, an omnibus list of everything that the town is doing, because one thing that you know is troubling to me is to say, well, what, what, why isn't Jewish History Month this year? When there was even an event, you know, so it's not like it's excluded. Right, right. But it's good for me to know, like if I'm, if somebody's asking me, you know, what's happening in town, rabbi, for the Jews, then I want a handy dandy reference sheet, right? So to be able to call that to, and that was also, I think, no money. It was just a few speakers, right? So that, so that kind of list, I think, is really helpful mm -hmm. because of what we were talking about earlier, which is that there are places that, events that we don't have to organize, but we can certainly ask 
to go and have a word about the Human Rights Commission, or we can ask to set up a table. And so we would get a lot of benefit without really being the organizers, and we would establish those partnerships that would come in handy in other ways. One so last thing, sorry. Uh, it would have to be the friends group that's that did that. Um, how? So I just want to no. point out that when I oh, go ahead, I did ask when I started if there is a um, a, a full list of of the events, and to my knowledge, that that doesn't currently exist. So that would need to be created, um, and there are lots of people who are, you know, or organizations, because some are being brought by the town council, other are being brought by other, we can make an attempt to perhaps review the events that occurred last year, but um, there's no guarantee that it will encompass everything. And we did, Jennifer and I had a discussion about the proclamations about whether they should be included, but some are being, um, are being made by, coming from the HRC and others are not. So it will give us a little bit of time to create that sort of omnibus yeah, list. Yeah, um, basically the, uh, the list will be very fluid because it's uh, every day you have a new issue and it's evolving, but we definitely are concerned with the local um, events that are happening. Example is again, the indigenous. I don't know whether that event was up on the list, but uh, that's good if we add to it and finalize it and work with that. It'll be a good advertising for us also if we have a table in every event. Thanks. I was just going to tell Deborah that we can have a couple. It usually says Human Rights Commission's donations or something similar to that, like a donation box at an event where people will donate money for events. That's fantastic. Because I'm happy to donate when I'm at every one of these events. Well, I just don't want to ask other people to donate. <laughs> no, and I, don't, I mean, I don't. You don't necessarily have to, but so that money goes into the the human rights gift account, right? So that's where we pull funds because we've. Is, is that is that a tax deductible account? It's a tax deductible account because it is associated with the town. So, um, so what was the goal of this discussion? Were we so, supposed to just aware? Yeah, I, I think that it just, I mean, the whole purpose of the retreat is to acclimate um, new and old members and go over the roles and responsibilities. So just some time, I think we can maybe go on to the next agenda item, which um, are roles and responsibilities, the relationship with town council, open meeting laws, conflict of, of interest and other laws and rules. And um, early this morning, I don't know if you guys had an opportunity to, um, to see it, but I did say if you were able to bring your appointed committee handbook that um, we'll spend just uh, some time going through some things that I want, I won't spend time in detail, uh, um, but just to point out um, uh, information there. Why don't you just go ahead and summarize for us what we need to know with regard to this or follow it if you want, because I don't, you know, I think it's going to be hard to discuss all six items here in one shot and be confusing. So if you wanna just tell us what we need to know with regard yeah. to this, we can ask questions. And then after the questions, we'll consider ourselves informed. You're making the assumption that I know all of this information, like the back of my hand, which no, I do not. I'm making the <laughs> assumption that you have the documentation. Included in the um, appointed committee handbook, the first thing that I would draw to your attention, which is the, I guess one, two, three, on the fifth page is the conflict of interest laws. So um, as we discussed earlier, um, even though you are unpaid and are volunteers appointed to this board, 
the uh, state statute does consider you a special municipal employee. And as a result, um, you need to be aware of conflict of interest. So if I were to summarize that very quickly, I would just say that for any um, financial interactions that you are involved in or immediate family or business associates, you need to be aware of whether that um, interaction would create a conflict of interest. So you would receive some gain or a family member would receive some gain based on your position as a member of the board. Um, so that's uh, a very, very brief, but the information is contained in more detail in your, uh, in your book. Um, the appointed, um, how about our relationship with the town council? Are there, are there limitations? As I understand it, we basically submit our report to them. They ask us to be, there's also reference to us being an advisory body. So I would imagine that if we have some policy advice or a human rights lens on policies that they're in the process of undertaking, then I would imagine that we could submit a letter or make a presentation, ask to get on the town council's agenda. Is there more? No, I think that's a good summary. So the the Human Rights Commission is an advisory bo body to the town manager and the town council. Um, so it, through my experience with the HRC last year, um, the committee provided advice uh, to the town council through the means that Ronnie just uh, mentioned by appearing in uh, in joint meetings with the town council to raise issues of concern by writing letters um, and having those letters become a part of the public record. So um, those are the primary ways but uh, that the HRC has interacted with the town council. Uh, open meeting laws. I think you um, again had an opportunity in your in your original packets to be aware that whenever there is a quorum, yep, there are as uh, there are open meeting laws that you need to be aware of. The um, in the past, uh, the body would have met in person, as Jennifer described. Um, uh, the governor has allowed for the extension of the rule, which allows you to meet. Um, via uh, remote means, so meeting on Zoom, having public comment, all of those things are part of the requirement for the open meeting laws. The documents that you um, that you draft and are included in the packet are all subject to open meeting laws, which means that any member of the public can request them, and they are would be viewed and you know and obviously this is redundant, but open to the public for review. Could you also explain why we're often asked not to reply all and that part of the law? So uh, you're asked not to reply all. If, if Jennifer and I send out an email asking for additional information, um, you're asked not to reply all because your email communication um, between and amongst yourself would be considered to be um, meeting right to be deliberations and you're not to allowed to deliberate outside of a posted open meeting are there any questions among the members regarding these topics of laws pertaining to our activity the only question I had, and I think I might have asked for this, um, is not about any of this stuff, but when I mentioned the relationship with town council, it was more like, okay, so we have to offer a report once a year. Is that the only relationship that we have? You know, do they, I guess they could call upon us if there's something that's in our docket or in our portfolio and they want to learn more about it. Um, but I, I just feel like I'm, I have no relationship with the town council whatsoever. I was appointed, I got my documents, I show up. I love having relationships with all of you, but it just feels like there's no vertical alignment or there's no vertical engagement. Mm -hmm. So there is um, 
a town council member who is, serves as a liaison to and um, who's invited to attend the, the minutes or the meetings of the HRC. So that person would um, also be able to report back to the town council or will sometimes give advice to the commission about um, uh, actions that they could take. So the, the best examples that I can give you is that um, the, the liaison to the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee often provided advice about approaches that that uh, com um, committee could take about their interactions with the town council. The liaison to the Disability Access and Advisory Committee um, often hears information in that uh, committee and takes information back. Most recently, the Disability Access and Advisory Committee received um, a request to endorse a piece of legislation that was pending at the State House, and the liaison um, said that she would also take uh, make a request to the full town um, council for them to also endorse that legislation. So there is that in, formal relationship between. But in two. our case, in all the time I've been here, I've never seen any town council member participating, and I don't know who our liaison is. So if you could inform us, that would be helpful so we can invite that person and get them more involved. In right. Our work. So I believe that you're the 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 liaison that's um, that was listed for last year, I believe was Pat DeAngelis. Um, I'm not certain if she still has this assignment for this year um, because she's also the liaison to the Disability Access and Advisory Committee. And she typically, uh, when she's able to attend those meetings, the liaison receives the same Zoom invite that you all receive for each of the, of the meetings. Right, but we don't know who the who our liaison is and we should. So I would like to suggest that we send a note to Lynn Griesmer asking that we be told who our liaison is. Yeah. So as co-chairs, you could you could do that. I yeah, I think we I'm ready to do it. Go for it. Today. The other piece that is difficult for me is um I'm not sure like I don't have the bandwidth to look at every commission and committee and the town council's agenda and see if it's something that I, as a human rights commission member, should show up for. That's a level of research and diligence that I don't have bandwidth for. So I don't even know if there are items on the agenda for the town council that I, as a human rights commission member, should um, attend that meeting because it's gonna impact what we do or it's gonna provide information that's important for what we do. And so I just feel like there's a wall, there's nothing. So it's great that we have a liaison, but I also want it to be that person to be telling us, oh, there's gonna be a meeting on this date and we're discussing this topic. And it'd be great if you could show up because it's gonna inform your deliberations. So not just with town council, there are other committees that we all need to be paying attention to. I regularly go to CSSJC meetings. I've gone to one on Tuesday. I also go to the um, Fair Housing Trust meetings. And if I can't get there, I get a report from one of the Fair Housing Trust committees. So we all should, as commissioners, be looking at all of the other entities and seeing which ones we want to go to just as informative. Sometimes they will call us in to speak and sometimes we are there just as an attendee that reports back to the Human Rights Commission. And again, we we get um, information and requests from other um, human rights committees um, along the state. I've been to the one from Barnstable on um, um, the hearing impairments. And there's another one coming up and I didn't really look at it yet, but um, so we can be aware of that. Um, um, what was I going to say? Okay, I just went somewhere else in my brain. I have a question then. So should there be some kind of um, a matrix that lists all of the committees and what they focus on, and then we should each take one? That is going to be our responsibility to be the liaison for that committee. I just feel like we're in a vacuum, at least in my experience. 
there's nothing formal. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think there's no communication amongst um, us. Might be that is missing, and that that's the reason we are feeling alienated. And there's another reason, or in another issue, or just small detail. I was wondering if we get those business cards. You know, the cards that we can use. Are there any that you gave out as a true? You know. So I, could I, I could I go back to the unfinished discussion about us participating? Sorry. I do believe Jacinta had her hand up a little while ago. For yeah, I guess I just wanted to. Um... Um, the comment uh, about, you know, what you were talking about, how there are a number of different commissions that have like more specific, um, more specific purposes. So kind of how human rights committee is a broader um, umbrella of things. And then so thinking about accessibility, I know like on Amherst College campus, we have a lot of, um, we lack a lot of accessibility access. Um, for people with walking disabilities, um, et cetera, um, hearing disabilities. Um, and so for that, it's sort of like, does the commission help to point people who have human right complaints towards those more specific commissions that can, um, you know, deal with those issues and bring forth those issues um, with the necessary resources for those things? I feel like because this commission is so has like a broader title, um, it allows people to kind of say, okay, I need to go here and then sort of be filtered through that. Um, and I guess I, I would also say that I feel like people who have more experience on this commission probably have more answers as to, you know, how to go about the town council um, and getting issues. I know coming at the end, of it seeing the human rights complaint about this uh, student who was harassed by a police officer. Um, I felt like I saw a lot of action being taken by the committee um, to have, even though it was years ago, um, to actually get some change or bring forth that issue. So I do feel like at the moment it might feel, I think coming off of summer, um, it can feel a little bit like nothing has happened, but I do, I do have faith that this, commission has you know dealt with these issues um excuse and, me I, yeah i are, are you pointing out at amherst college that they are not inclusive because of the access disability access and other services is amherst college you're pointing out you said in the beginning amherst college i mean that was an example but yes amherst college has like a number of um to me, what would be considered a human rights violation, but I don't know if that is a human rights violation by the town um, definition. Yeah, there is a discrimination. If, if disability is an, you know, you need to have an access coordinator for that. Um, UMass has uh, several of them, and it is it's really important part of inclusivity and and human rights also. So no doubt. So might be that. As a human rights commission, we uh, approach Amherst College or something, or raise awareness over there. If you go to amherstma.gov and to HRC, there's a form there, and that's a starting place. And if you don't want to fill out a form, there's a number to call and so on. So I think really anyone who faces what they think may be a violation, um, I think that instruction is clear. The problem is we haven't really made that clear beyond the website. Not everyone thinks to go there. And I, I actually looked at it and I think it is a very um, well articulated process that in my view is just not well marketed yet. Um, and then to go back to Deborah's question about all the places, there's an issue with human rights, as you said too, that it's so broad, where do we go? I went to the um, list of committees on the town government website and there are over a hundred of them, literally. So for anyone, I think to sit down and even create a matrix, by the time they're done, the list will change, I guarantee you. So my recommendation, I can tell you what I did. I just went through the list and went, saw the ones that had headings that I thought may be of interest to me. 
And I think we should all do that so that we can then combine our interest with the representation of the HRC. Yeah. And so the yeah. CSSJC as, um, mm -hmm. and the Housing Trust, as Liz has mentioned, yeah. you know, we're closer to because there have been people here who've gone on a regular basis. And so we should find the others. And I can tell you, I went to the energy um, group. I attended their meetings. I attended the shade committee meetings because I'm interested in trees and so on. So go to a few of them. And then eventually you'll run into one that you think you want to follow and where maybe you can report to the HRC on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah, that's a very excellent point, actually. And it opens up another uh, Mendora's box because uh, M town of Amherst has all these uh, institutions, educational, basically th they are the ones who are generating a lot of revenue and so on. So if we uh, approach uh, uh, our, we, if we actually interact with them directly and that will create awareness and it will give them also the, um, you know, the fact that it will give them the opportunity to meet us as a HRC, you know, and they, that's a good thing if we can have a dialogue with them and, and they can help us uh, advertise our services also uh, to the students and, and, and we can give them ideas and strategies. I think that's a great idea, Ronnie. And I, I'm looking at it right now and I'm like, oh, the Cultural Council. Why are we throwing cultural events? Why isn't the Cultural Council doing that? I'm just, that's an honest question, not a blame or anything like that. <laughs> Jennifer? They give out grant money. They're not, they're not like a cultural, they give out grant money. So they support Juneteenth for us. That's the committee that they give. So that's one to. of our sources of income. Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. If no one else is interested in schools, I'm on it. Trust me, I've been following them. I'm not reporting on them, but I've been following them as someone who just retired of 40 years from the regional school district. I think certainly the schools could use a fresh eye, um, but yeah, whatever, but each but of I, us could do that. Yeah, I don't and want then, to short circuit your great idea. No, that's fine. I, I'm just saying that the second part of that is that the idea then is that you would report back to the HRC at our meetings and that you're in your relationship there and the information you gather and that you're able to give back will also inform how we work. And so we can be more effective. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to do our own work individually as far as figuring out which one is the one or two that you wanna go to because there's so many. Um, so are there any more questions concerning C roles and responsibilities? Okay. Um, so then moving on to, I'm sorry, can I just, I want to make sure that this is clear and I'm sure everybody is aware, but the human rights commission only really has power as the commission itself. So as individuals, you do not have the permission necessarily to speak on behalf of the HRC. So your power is in within the vote. So it means when you guys are all together that you're acting. So what are the implications if, for instance, I'm at the CSSJC meeting and somebody says, oh, the co-chair of the Human Rights Commission is here and asks my opinion on something. Do I have to say I'm speaking as an individual resident, not as the chair? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Are you guys, can I take this down? This can easily be found on AmherstMA.gov. And it's also another way to get folks that you know involved. Mm -hmm. So then, um, do you want to do you want to facilitate the next one? Rules and procedure for public meetings. Oh, it's public con comment time. Is there any public? No, it's not public comment time. We it's... just need to make sure that we understand ah, um, the rules and procedures for public comments. And one of the things that you, um, it's also in the open meeting law or educational materials that you should have received once you got sworn in. Um, so you should be familiar with that. Um, one of the things that I learned as a first meeting commissioner is that when there is public comment, that's what it is. And we do not respond to public comment as much as I wanted to. Jennifer said, no. <laughs> 
I did ask, can I respond to that? Um, so that's one of the most important things, but um, from public comments, um, if there was something that we need to put on the agenda for, in, in a, a different meeting, we can do that. But it's just for us to hear what people have to say. Um, and sometimes it relates to what we're working on and sometimes it does not. Yeah, okay, uh, I'd like to, um, in a different meeting, uh, go over the public comment because it can become an issue also. Uh, how do you address the public comments? No, so, we don't address public comments. What I mean is that if there was something that's relevant that comes out of public comment, we can put that on the agenda for a subsequent meeting, but not comment on it while it's happening in live feed. So the rationale behind that is that if you receive a public comment about something that you're that's listed on the agenda that you're currently deliberating on, you will, as part of your meeting, would take action on it. So there would be no need for you to have conversation back and forth because it's already an agenda item that you are presumably going to take action on. If someone raises an issue that's not listed on your agenda, um, then you're deliberating on something that's not hasn't been posted in the um, public, you know, in your public um, notice of meeting. So that's another rationale for why you would be listening, not responding, and then placing it on the agenda for the future meeting. So that um, if it's placed on the agenda for a future meeting, the public has noticed that you intend to deliberate on that topic. So that helps to explain just a little bit. Why? So it looks like the next thing in the, um, that you asked to be placed on the agenda, and this is a discussion that I assume um, the chairs and co-chairs will lead, is uh, supporting other organizations. So I asked actually for this to be put on the agenda. We received uh, a um, email a request from someone to support something. And the question is, should we or shouldn't we? And my question was, we need to take a look at how we are supporting other organizations and which ones we are supporting. We can't think um, just, oh, this one wants us to support them. How do we support them? Are we talking about in person? Are we talking about helping them fundraise? Are we talking about going to the event and being a willing participant as an organization? How are we supporting them? So the question is not specific to that organization, but taking a look at how we support other organizations, especially when requests come in. And Any I thoughts? Would, I would add to the organizations, just other national events that happen. So the co-chairs prior to, to this group used to write statements. They had the permission from the HRC members to write statements of support for different events that were happening nationally that affected us locally. So, you know, for instance, the war in Ukraine or uh, the, the murder of George Floyd. Like, so the co-chairs wrote these statements, small statements, and I would put them on, if you look on the HRC webpage, you'll see there's all these links to different statements. And then they also go up on the Facebook page. I would really like some order to that because when I saw it, I thought, well, why are we talking about Ukraine, but we're not talking mm -hmm. about another place. Sure. Um, so it would just help me a lot to, I think these statements, I don't know. I mean, they have to be okayed by the commission and that, um, uh, you know, we have to have some reason or some sort of- Deli Deliberation, I guess. Um, deliberation if needed, but I'm not really comfortable having the commission tell the co-chairs you can write them when you think it's appropriate. Because I, I mean, is there no way under open meeting law for us to have a group um, open email exchange where we say, oh, this just happened in Israel, so, or this just, forget Israel, this just happened in Zimbabwe. So we are go. we would like to write a statement and have the statement reviewed and approved by the commissions online. Mm -hmm. So I think that the the two co-chairs, usually the 
topic would go to the meeting. The problem is they don't meet for another month, so they would give the co-chairs the permission to write the statement. So it wasn't is, that they were just yeah. like, oh, I woke up this morning and I'm going to. No, I read this in the news yeah. and I feel a statement has to go out. That's not it. So it is pre-approved by yeah. issue by. But okay, the, but thank but you. But that's clearer to me. But I, I think you raised something that's important, which is I'm not a fan of statements personally. I don't think they do anything. So, um, I mean, except they do help the public, the community know where we're coming from. But since we are a uh, a body that serves Amherst for us to make statement on Ukraine or anywhere else. I I, I question how important that is um, in terms of the use of our time. But what that leads me to is what are our criteria for doing anything that's not part of our like regular template of activities, whether that's supporting another organization or writing a statement. And so when I say what are our criteria, things that arise for me are like, um, they're clearly connected to our mission. And, you know, we could show that it's connected to our mission, number one. Number two, our constituents are going to get some benefit out of our doing it. Otherwise, like, why are we spending the time out of it on doing it? Three, I'm a fan of uh, partnering with organizations on campaigns. So, like, not signing off on statements, and I don't mean political you know, electoral campaigns. I mean, um, all right, what's a campaign? Oh, we're all gonna get together and say we have to, you know, relieve student debt. And there's 2000 national organizations and 20,000 local organizations doing X, Y, Z to make sure that we cancel student debt. That's a random example. I'm not saying it's something, we should, right? So like, it, what's the impact? Like there's a discernible impact and there's enough resources going towards it, not just our resources, that there's a hope of something changing. So those are criteria that are attractive to me. There might be 17 other criteria that are attracted to other people and maybe uh, nobody likes this idea at all, but that's. <laughs> like a rubric we are creating. So we have a consensus based on that. Mm -hmm. And I think so also, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jacinta. Oh, I was just gonna say like, um, all human rights violations are important, equally important. Bringing attention to one versus others does create like sort of a, what like what about the other one? So I can kind of see how you can make a statement or include in that criteria that for any anything that kind of is grabbing attention in the media, um, if you're thinking from a sense, oh, okay, now the HRC sends out an email, talking about like the most recent thing that's happened and then pointing to other things that are happening at the same time. It's an opportunity to like use that sensationalism to bring awareness to other things happening. Um, and just also, you know, letting constituents know that the HRC at a local level are, are thinking about numbers of different communities that are going through those experiences. Yeah, there's also the fact that we have refugees from many places that are far from here. And so there are issues that are pertinent to them that, you know, they live here, but they're, they're, those violations aren't happening here uh, per se. So I don't know. I mean, I think the criteria discussion does need to be had. I'm not sure where it would lead us, perhaps not. At because, yeah, yeah, because I think the majority of our issues, uh, our, our concerns, our statements should be focused on the constituents in the town and how are they affected uh, directly or indirectly. Basically, I feel that uh, otherwise the issues are too many, unless, as you, um, Deborah said, it's a student loan type of a big issue and so on. But I think we shouldn't get too political, but uh, the fact is, like racial justice is very current over here. I stand out also for racial justice. So that is very close to our hearts as uh, citizens over here. So if we just isolate those uh, issues and work on them. Well, you, guys, you guys have one that's on the docket now and that is the youth, um, the voting, whether or not to support the changing the age of Increasing the age of, and yeah, yes, twenty-two. 
21, 22? Yeah. They're asking for 21, but you know, there's evidence that it takes until age 23 for your brain to settle down. So it depends on what- It was 25 for- Oh. Or... Well, and also where I was looking at it is that you can be in high school until you're 22. So maybe 22 should be the number because it's already something that's governed by our, our laws of the state. So do we, uh, can we address that issue right now? Can we talk about it? Or what, what, what we you... can, but I also want to just also address the reason why we got this while, while I put this on for the agenda for today. Um, all of you all should have gotten this email. Um, I am the coordinator with the Western Mass Asylum Support Network. We have been active as a group of volunteers providing mutual aid about 2018. We have supported dozens of asylum seekers making the transition into the area and getting settled working with them to secure housing, legal support, and work permits, among other things. I'm writing to find out if the commission has any small grants to support social justice groups like this. Um, I will be grateful for any information that this leads. Now, as we was just talking about some of the other entities that we may want to support, either as a group or an individual, this could be one of them. Do we have small grants? No. Is there some other way that we may be able to support them? Maybe. And that's part of what we needed to talk about directly, but also these are gonna to continue to come in and how do we address them or and or prioritize them when they do not directly affect the members of the Amherst community or there might be members of the Amherst community that this affects, we don't know yet. Um, but I just wanted to have us start thinking about how we um, support other entities when they're asking for us of our support. We don't have small grants to give them, but are there other ways to support this group of people? Um, I guess like, I don't have answers now. <laughs> I'm happy like have that conversation. I'm excited to see what people have to bring forth for that. I guess what I also wanted to say about the statements conversation um, is like also celebrating like human rights, um, you know, like things happening, maybe like um, just the idea that like there's violations, but there's also um, ways that we are advancing in some areas too. So I feel like bringing attention to both things also is important. I don't know the right word I'm looking for, but you know, the idea that like there's joy and there's also like serious issues at the same time. Okay, basically our accomplishments, you're saying we should also celebrate those accomplishments? Um, I don't think we would go about doing either, but I feel like if we do choose to bring attention to certain things, we should also bring attention to the positive ones as well. Yes. So clearly one thing that's happening now throughout the country, and I'm not sure to what extent Amherst is taking in, but there's a huge inflow of refugees from so many different places in the world. And you're seeing American cities take them in. To me, that's really a, a very positive thing that would not have happened at, a, at another time. So, but it, it's not the only thing that's happening in that area, of course, but it's the brighter side. It's not like everybody's being killed at the border. There are people who are getting through and these, you know, like, 100,000 Venezuelans, I think, just got legally authorized to work in New York. And Massachusetts just gave driver's license to everybody. Yeah. So there are things like that that are happening that I think are allowing people to live whole lives, which is their right. I know Massachusetts also like uh, made it free uh, to get your um, your undergraduate bachelor degree at once if you're 25. Um, so and still, you can't afford it's a degree. it. So it's a degree, yeah, at a community college. So I um I just want to draw your attention back to the beginning of this conversation because I'm not sure that I had heard a resolution to the question about whether the co-chairs would be authorized to act on behalf of the commission in drafting letters. And uh, I think... I think it's important for you to have some clarity uh, about that. So, and Jennifer can correct me um, if I'm wrong, but when the co-chairs 
acted in the past, they would send in the document to Jennifer and I, who would then send it to all of the members who could respond back to us. So if someone had a strong objection to something that was in a draft document, they would have an opportunity to um, to bring that to the attention, but would it would still be done in a way that did not circumvent the open uh, meeting law. But you, I think you need to decide yay or nay, whether you're going, whether co-chairs are going to have that authority or not have that authority. So there's just clarity. Okay, before we go into, I just have this point that as uh, per se reply all, it's just the email thing when we have an email from you. So we will be sending our uh, approval as a reply all. No, you cannot do that. Oh, so oh, you, you'd, you'd have to send in your comments to to Jennifer and I. Is if this you like do a reply all? It's as if you were having a meeting and we can't have a meeting. So that's why you can't use the reply all. Like a Google form. No, because you're not allowed to deliberate um, outside of a post-it meeting. So a, a Google form would allow you to deliberate because every people would have the ability to add comments, make comments, and that would be deliberation. It's so like a hub hiking. of a wheel. So somebody drafts something, sends it to Jennifer and Pamela, and then they can send it out to everyone else. And everyone else can send an, an email back to wh whoever sent it to us. So it's uh, inefficient, but it's the way we need to function. Uh, I know Google there's, Forms there's is one, just there's a There's one bullet. first step to that, which is that a letter doesn't get, first it gets discussed here, and there's a decision that a letter will go out. Then the co-chairs will draft something. Right, and I wanted to say that I have, this is something I have had experience with. Um, I volunteered to draft something. And so I want to, and the co-chair said, go for it. So I want to say that I don't want it to be limited to the co-chairs, and I'm not sure why it is. I think uh, I'm happy saying the co-chairs um, or whoever they delegate it to. But, you know, if the co-chairs have to do everything, if the co-chairs have to write the letters and the co-chairs have to represent us here or there and the co-chairs, whatever, have to be involved in the mediation, that's like, a that's too big a job. There's, you know, we can have up to nine people, so why can't they delegate? I would agree to adding the delegation part. So the co-chairs don't necessarily have to be the ones writing the letter. That's just what the other group did. So you guys have the ability to pick whomever you would like to do that or no one and just say any member. And then that way that's inclusive of the co-chairs or not, you know, to everybody in the group. The important piece from that perspective from, from me and Pamela's piece is that you guys are not replying all. So Jacenta, to kind of finish up your question, the Google Doc itself, because you can send me a Google, a Google Doc and then I can change, make edits to it, that is deliberating in a meeting. A, go a Google form is just a survey form. Yeah, but anything that's going to require the group to make any kind of decision or any kind of like, oh, we could all meet on this one day, we can't have you do that on a Google form because that's deliberating. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm not like it. It's it tied doesn't, to this it Google doesn't, form or not. Yeah, no. But I agree. I, I I hear what you're saying. It's just the way that it operates because it's a an issue of transparency for the rest of the community, right? So that the groups aren't having like secret meetings and and having other discussions that aren't that the public yeah. aren't aware of. And then uh, there was something about. The problem with the statements and things happening in the HRC, and one of the reasons why the, I think the co-chairs were designated as that individual, because things don't happen two days before our meetings, right? Things happen two days after our meeting, and then we don't meet for another 28 plus days. So that was another reason, but anybody, you know, if we know that there's something national and Liz sends an email to us that says, hey, I think that somebody should take a look at this, reply to Jennifer and Pamela if you're interested, then maybe that would work. But it's just that we, you know, things don't fit in these neat little boxes, right? Like the way that we would want them to. They're, they happen sporadically. Yeah. I personally feel it's fine for the co-chairs to delegate because that makes it less confusing for you. Um, yeah, I agree. And and there's another thing that I uh, um, totally I want to share also that we should always have one statement per 
month like when we have a meeting we should do that as a you know rule so that you know there we are out there and we are basically publicly advertising ourselves also as uh, you know hrc from town of amherst so often in the past when there have been big you know, so Amherst is a welcoming community, right? And that was something that's on the HRC webpage. And that statement came from the superintendent of schools, the town manager, and the police of chief, chief police. I'm trying to go to the webpage because there's another one where the chair often in, uh, the chair of the commission alongside the chief of police and the town manager have signed off on statements before. And so that's another thing is that sometimes it's not that the HRC takes it on, but the town takes it on and wants the chair or the co-chairs of the HRC to sign off on it. So going back to the original question was about supporting other organizations. I would suggest that if there's a request that comes in from an organ other organization asking for our support, if we have not had a meeting um, and we have the time to put it on our agenda, we should do that for the committee to discuss. And if we've already had our meeting, then the entity needs to know that our next meeting, it's not gonna happen for 28 days and we can't do anything until we discuss it as an organization. How about that? I second. <laughs> I agree. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, six to zero. And then do we ask the question about the delegating for like more um, uh, for things happening sooner? Um, or that need like to be called to, to to attention like sooner? Is that something we have to agree on? We discussed that a little bit in a meeting in August or August or I'm, someone. I'm gonna screen share this one because I think it's a great example of who. Well, Jennifer's um, uh, pulling that up. I, I thought that the answer to your question was that the uh, there you guys had reached consistent consensus that the co-chairs would designate someone to write a letter if one was needed um you know prior to a meeting or there would needed to be a rapid or quick response that there so the co-chairs would either write it or delegate it okay my apologies for leaving the room uh briefly, but do we still need to discuss those two requests? If the request was monetary, the request is monetary or other. So the monetary request we cannot do. We don't have the money to do it. So that's easy. I would suggest that if in fact there were members of the community, I would like to know from them what the other Things are they talking about giving people rides? Are we supporting them as an organization? Are we supporting them as individuals? Um, and how that kind of thing will come about. Um, it's not our town government or governance. Is that the right word? So it doesn't mean that we have to, um, but as an individual, you can if you would like, but not as a representative of the Human Rights Commission if we have not all decided that we are going to do it as a unit. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to ask, are we trying to call the question, are we going to do something collectively? Is that on the table? I know we can't give money. The other piece was, can we do something else? And my question is, are we talking about that now? Or I personally am not talking about that, but if you'd like to, you can. I'd, I'd like to put wait, it to I, bed. I don't want this to just- I think we did put it to bed, which is that we said we would discuss it at the meeting. Is it this meeting? No, we're going to discuss Are it we next discussing week. these particular things That's right now? That's my question. That, I don't see why not. I think it can be really quick. I don't think we should do anything for the, the asylum seeker group. There's hundreds of congregations and community associations that are doing this kind of refugee. We act. Yeah, we act on the things that we take the initiative on. 
right? I think, I don't, I don't know what we're talking about. Like we're going to go uh, attending meetings from other groups and we're going to, we have, right now we have 11 cultural events and we're going to be mediating disputes. Like so I don't have the bandwidth as a group to say, yes, as a group, we're going to figure out how we're going to support this Western Massachusetts asylum seeking network. So I would say, we would say, sorry, we don't have money to grant and we don't, you know, we, our docket is filled in terms of activity. Um, I feel like for the the agenda for today, supporting other organizations, I don't have like the full context as to what groups specifically came forth or anything. So it came up because this group asked us for our support. And so um, my assumption when I got the request was that this is not gonna be the first time. So we should have a discussion at our meeting or our retreat as to how we proceed when other people asked for the support. So that's part of it. And then I, for one, and Deborah as well have said, we, I can't, as a unit, don't um, suggest we move forward with supporting them. We don't have the resources or the time given what's going on in our own town. But what were they? Like, I don't know who- You heard, can. Liz just read their request. That was a hundred percent of the information that we have. Do you want to hear it again? I think she's, I think she's, no, I think she's asking, there was the specific and then the general. I think she's asking how we proceed with the general. No. No? Um, there were two organizations. So I guess like maybe I had like a brain freeze or something, but um, just, I wanted to know, like you mentioned an asylum seeking organization and then one other one. Right, and we're taking this one at a time. So the asylum seeking organization, Liz just read the one email that we got from them, that's it. And then once we decide if we're gonna do something there, and I think maybe Liz should read that again, then we'll go back to the other organization. No, the other one was that we keep getting requests from Barnstable Human Rights Commission, but they're more asking us, hey, we're doing this Zoom webinar. Can you, you wanna join us and listen in? And I personally wanted to listen in and report back and say, hey, you know, they're doing work around um, the hearing impaired and they had some very good um, ideas and suggestions and, and definitions. And maybe we can bring that person here so that we could better understand how we support as a council the, the hearing impaired in our own community, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is a specific request for support monetarily and or I'm assuming physically and right now with that organization, I'm saying personally, I given what's already on our docket, because I'm assuming that we're going to start getting some more stuff when we have some changes coming in on our legislation for the town. We have elections coming up for, for school committee and town council. We don't have a superintendent for our schools. Well, we have an acting superintendent for our schools right now. We don't have an assistant superintendent. We don't have a de uh, department of equity and inclusion in our schools. Um, we started the school year without a seventh grade guidance counselor. We need to be aware of some of these things and how do we respond or listen and be ready to support what's going on in our town. So when someone else, it's like this group is asking us to support them, She's saying, and she didn't even know all of that stuff was going on when I just mentioned that, that we have a lot of other things in our town to deal with and we can't, don't have the, um, I don't know, what's the word you use? Bandwidth? Bandwidth and or resources and or um, capacity right now to take on someone else's town or someone else's agenda because we're going to have we're going to be full in our agenda in january we're going to have a new town council right now we have an interim school committee in january we're going to have a new school committee and we need to look at all of that and be aware of all of that as we move forward with everything that we do so before you move on to the last of the agenda items i would um wait I, th sorry <laughs> that was adult going right and i i don't think we've ever made a decision on that and they came to our meeting like two months ago 
Right. So I, I think... thought we did decide and we did sign off on it. Did we? Do you know what happened? So you wanted to support it, but didn't know exactly what you were going to support and how you were supported. This is what happens when committees meet once a month. This is right. why things get uh, tabled for so long. So I thought I had forwarded everybody the template that was sent to us, right? And then I didn't hear anything back. So I sent the template and I needed someone to like sign off on the template and then we can forward that template because they give you an already statement already drafted that you guys can sign off on and send on it and send it back and send it to the legislative, the legisl state legislators. Have we passed the time, yes. the deadline? I seem to remember there was a deadline. I have, I don't, I don't remember that piece. Okay. I think we should send it because I think that our agreement was that we would send it and all they need is our signature, a statement of support. They don't need anything more from us. And I think we all supported it, right? So can we now agree that we will send it? So Jennifer, do you yeah. need one of the co-chairs to sign off or something or can what needs to happen if we all agree? Well, I think so. Here's something that you guys need to figure out. Do you want your co-chairs just to sign it? Do you want it to say on behalf of the Human Rights Commission? Do you want your co-chairs to sign it and say on behalf of the Human Rights Commission? That is up yeah. to you guys I how think, that gets um, done. I don't care about the signature, but I think we do need the stamp that has the Human Rights Commission because that's the strength. Okay. You would right. like a stamp that says Human Rights Commission. And in yeah, the meantime, you also have a sign it. That's an additional thing. So it depends on. Yeah. Are you all OK with having us sign it? Plus the stamp. I'm yeah. so OK with having you sign it. I yeah, want this move yes. forward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah so I like let's that. Let's yes. that done. Yeah. We'll, work, we'll work with Jen on that. And yes to the youth and no, we're not saying no to the refugees. We're saying no to the specific request from this organization. All right. So we're moving on to the priority. Are you talking about well, just going to suggest point of that order. you take official action on that. So you need to um, have a motion, have it second, take a vote that the commission is taking action to send a letter of support for the uh, legislation um, Raising uh, uh, revising youth offenders, right? And similarly, you also would need um, to have some sort of motion second um, that you have decided as a body to inform, right, which could be through the co-chairs uh, drafting a letter, the asylum seeker, uh, refugee, that you are unable to um, respond to, the, you know, to their requests. I move that we uh, sign a letter of support for the youth legislation, um, changing the age of majority. Um, <clears throat> I second that. We've yeah. had lots of discussions already. So uh, we've heard the motion, we've heard the second, we've already had discussion. Is there any further discussion? Nope. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Vote passes six zero. Are we looking for a motion to? I move that we inform the folks from the Western Massachusetts Asylum Organization that we can't be, uh, we cannot say yes to their request at this time. I second that. So you heard the motion. You heard the second. Are there any further discussions? No. no. Jennifer, I'm just going to say that they weren't really asking for anything except for the grants. And I already told them that they don't, we don't have grants, but that I would follow forward the email to you all to see if there were other ways that you would like to support. So I'm not sure that anything else really needs, needs to happen there because I already, I mean, I'll on my behalf, send it and say like, we don't, I mean, that was, that's all I did. I just said, we don't do grants. Okay. So question then, um, so are they trying to raise awareness specifically or were they just at, they're just asking for grants. They're not looking to raise awareness. They were looking for small grants so that they can do their charge. So they can fulfill their mission. Okay. So would, is that something like that we could talk about as part of it? Like, I, it sounds like we have a lot of other things to take care of. Um, but I guess my question is sort of like, 
if they were looking to raise awareness, would that would some part of that be us having a conversation about it in the agenda of like the state of refugees um, in Amherst, Massachusetts? I mean, it could be as simple as that too, right? Like we just, we just promoted, not promoted, but we just brought attention to their organization by having it in this conversation that will be recorded that someone will view one day. I think it would be helpful actually if you, for instance, could take on, or a couple of people on the commission could take on the job at looking at the numbers of refugees and the population of Amherst and bringing that to us to discuss as and putting it on the agenda so we can look at the state of refugees in the town of Amherst. Because I know the refugees, where are they all from? And I understand the Cambodian refugees have been here, are, I think the longest and we should look at that. We should we should even look at that history of our acceptance of refugees and are we giving them a fair shake? Um, and yeah, and that, I don't that, know if that will. There are lots of Zaire refugees that I know are isolated because they don't they don't come here speaking English. They're more recently they're the Afghan refugees. Same thing. Yeah. So I guess like for that, like I I guess I just what I find important is the acknowledgement that they approached us. I'm sure they approached a bunch of other organizations as well um but just kind of acknowledging that like they were looking to have like to spread awareness at a local level as well and then i guess part of that is yeah so some commit like committee members can take that on privately um but i guess in like a group setting or on a like agenda um as a piece of the agenda um kind of imagining what that could look like for supporting organizations of having a conversation about it um i had another idea but i can't remember what it is right now but anyway it doesn't sound yeah. like we have to like yeah, I, I, to yeah do anything basically about it. i don't know their mission also uh what uh, they are looking at are they fulfilling their own awareness or what is the mission so we don't know and plus we as in the beginning said we more I think personally, I think um, for myself, I'm more concerned about uh, the, what's going on in town of Amherst. If we have uh, what kind of a demographics we have uh, refugee wise. So I guess my point was more just like, is it helpful if we do talk about it and it is like recorded um, for them to have that sort of like um, advertising on like a at, as part of the conversations by the HRC um, for their potential to apply for grants. So like we can't help them monetarily, but in spreading that um, cause, we I, could possibly. I mean, I think to some degree it does have to go on the agenda, whether you support it or not, because I can't tell the individual that you guys aren't going to support them, which is what I could say was we don't have any funds for grants, but I will forward your email to see if the commissioners have other ways that they can support you, which is what I did. And then you guys feel like you they didn't, but it will, we will follow that type of pattern, I would assume, regardless, right? So when the, the youth lift the age for the, the youth came about, she sent me a big thing. I forwarded it to you guys. We put it on the agenda. She came to the meeting and we talked about it, right? Like it'll always move in that way. Because I, myself, I don't have the authority to tell someone that you guys will or will not support. There's another thing also that came to my mind is that uh, refugees versus the alien you know who are coming without the visas they're two different entities and they are also having problems and issues the refugees get a lot of um somewhat a lot of funding from the federal aid also you know so they're living everything is done for them so what basically what is going on is this cultural differences that are being mitigated so otherwise refugees are uh, from where they're coming it, it was difficult, you know, war environment and all that, but they are funded by the federal budget. Okay, so I guess for that in terms of actual what we're talking about and not in just specifically that example, um, we could email them back and say, hey, if you would like to come to a meeting and have a representative talk about it, then we can respond to that as to whether or not this makes sense with our own mission specifically um, so that they can be heard 
other than just on the email as a way to support other organizations. Yeah, but uh, again, the contention is whether they are interested also, obviously, in in raising awareness. The mission might not be that awareness for them. Maybe they just want the grants and might not be interested. And it might be it's a waste of time for them if we say, again, you know, we don't have funds. So if Jennifer has already responded saying we don't have the grants, I was merely putting this on the agenda because we're going to keep getting requests, not necessarily to discuss this one. However, um, once Jennifer says we don't have the funds, if they said, are there other ways that we can support, then we would put them on the agenda for whatever the uh, meeting, if we have space for the next, whatever the next meeting is, and then they could come. The request should come from them, not from us, I think. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I, I just want to raise a concern. that our meetings are filled with these kinds of requests. And then we, if we say yes to one, we say, have to say yes to everyone. And um, I've only been on for a few months and you know we've already had the youth group come on, which was fantastic, and this request. And so I have no idea, it, like, and then if once organizations get wind that if they ask, we'll have them and these public meetings, I just uh, have a concern about opening up the floodgates. Like if, if you say yes to one, then you say yes to all. And that might be a totally irrational concern. It might be. So I share your interest and I also have this concern. We've had more than that because we also had the one from the Jones Library um, um, gender thing that we said we would support. And then the other factions didn't support, so it didn't go anywhere, you know? So we, we, we have our... The cinema. Oh, yes. Don't tell me it didn't go anywhere. I thought we all supported. So we have we, we. However, I do believe that Pamela sent us an email, if I'm not mistaken, stating that we would support it, but it was contingent upon the other folks supporting as well, and the other folks balked. So therefore, that did not happen. We said yes. Other folks did not. So we have to remember all of the I would the like to know what happened that. with that. Great memory. I'd like uh, a final uh, word on what happened with that, because I thought we supported it. So this body did vote to support $125 towards a $500 full donation to Amherst Cinema, but you did not get support from two of the other four, uh, two of the other three um, bodies. And so there was not enough funds yeah. to do it so we didn't have enough to fill that gap no we don't no. your your, your co coffers are pretty much at zero <laughs> so yeah. i find it very frustrating that we have no money at all and we're given a mandate like ensure that human rights are protected and no power shall go unchecked i mean come on i think we really need some resources if we're going you know we don't have any clout to resolve problems but we should be ha we should have the resources to increase awareness. I I personally think we are more like a pressure group, and that's good also. You know, pressure group on policies and so on. So because uh, because we are all volunteers, and once a month we are doing this. So my suggestion, given that fallback, um, and given that we just took a look at, um, our. our great budget for a great number of activities that we could be doing that we have no money for. And given all of that, um, we should, as a group, uh, make an appointment with the town council. And part of this conversation with them would be just that. Um, now, if that was to happen, it, we'd have to do it, um, request to be on their docket. And then we would have to show up, not just one or two of us, but maybe all of us, right? So um, Pamela has some suggestions about that because I can see your mind 
I read and write through her. Yeah. So I do think that the annual report that Philip um, presented to the um, town council is a good starting point for that conversation about financial resources. And the town is just beginning to start the budgetary process for planning. So you, the timing is right. The Unfortunately, like the report um, that was submitted at the end of last fiscal year came after the decisions about finances for appropriations. So you're now at a position where you have last year's report, you have a better understanding about what you want the scope of your work to look like and to be able to do. And so I think you're in a position where you can make an argument as they go forward with appropriations to think about appropriations to the Human Rights Commission. Um, as I'm reminded all of the time, you know, the budget is tight and limited, but that doesn't pre prevent a very strong ask. And, um, you know, I would say garnering some support from some of the town councils to support whatever that ask is. I acknowledge just, you, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm just going to say that, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about with the different boards and committees, just because like the folks from CSSJC came in or the Community Safety Working Group and so much of their charge was regarding the budget, same with the AHRA, but had no idea about how the budget process worked is that in for the next meeting, I will put in the presentation for the budget and how that process rolls out so that you guys can see and I would still say yes to the the state of the human rights, but it never hurts to go to public comment and speak. So here's what I'm going to say about that. If we don't ask, we won't receive. If we do ask, the, the least they can do is listen. I mean, the most they can do is give us the money. The least they can do is listen and say, we don't have it. So, and we're not going to get it if we don't ask. But I think we should be well prepared before we go, go in front of them. Do we need a motion for this? If I could just make one more comment, there is always discretionary money in all the budgets. So I certainly would not rule out the monies they have now. We're talking about not being able to support at a time when all the stuff that's going on with gender in this town, not being able to support this movie series because of a few hundred dollars Surely that's available in discretionary funds. So I think we should go for it and say, set aside some for us now. But that, that wasn't the ask. We talk about the ask for next year. That wasn't the ask. The ask was for $125 from each of the four people. I and know. we fulfilled ours. So but if it's the other folks didn't us, fulfill them. That wasn't the ask. We responded to the ask. Right. I know we responded to the ask, but we had the choice. I mean, within the system, if it's important to us and it's not important to anybody else, that doesn't mean I'm not happy or content saying, okay, it's not important to them, to them so it's done. I would have gone back and said, Where's, where can we find the other $300 or whatever it was? And it had to have existed in the system. None of us asked for it because we had it all chopped up to make it more accessible, I understand. But if we have an issue that's important, I think we need to go after that. Well, I think that's good advice for the future, but I think the, the moment has passed for this particular ask. So my question was, do we need a motion to say we're going to approach the town council um, with a budgetary request, or can that just be something that we do? And my second question is, the last time I got an invitation to join uh, the representatives of this commission at the town council, I got that invitation 48 hours before the meeting. And I don't usually function with that kind of availability, you know, 48 hours notice. So yeah, if we get on their agenda, do we, can we get more than 48 hours notice? So, so oh, go ahead. So I was going to make a suggestion that the co-chairs write to the town council president um, seeking an opportunity to be on their agenda. And I mean, the town council president generally sets the um, agenda um, and would select a date that would be made known to us. And there are sometimes some flexibility. So if I give, for example, um, last year, the uh, community Safety and Social Justice Committee 
um, went back and forth on the dates. Like it's sometimes difficult to to select a date because you have their um, schedule, which is pretty much set in stone, but then coordinating that with the others. But I, I would start the conversation that, that way. This is where it would be really helpful to have our liaison because that person is talking to the town with the town council. They're deliberating on all kinds of things and they could say, oh, wait, we could use this 15 minute block for the HRC. I'll send that note out also to, or we will send that note out to Lynn Griesmer. I'll draft it for you. To and Deb, the 48 hours is because meetings don't have to be posted. They have to be minimally posted 48 hours in advance. And so I don't, I'm not 100% sure where the meeting notice came from, but that's the way that they, it just has to be done 48 hours in advance. So if Ronnie makes it, has conversation with Lynn about a future time, then Ronnie can respond and say, this is will be when the meeting will be, but you might not get that Zoom link or information until 48 hours in advance. Yeah, so I'm just asking that the commission members be notified before the public notice is made so that we, I want to be there. I want to come, I want to comply with your expectation that we have 100% attendance. I really do. And I generally need more than 48 hours notice to be able to do that. Normally, we would know when we're invited more than 48 hours. And that means that we would get that information to you. The Zoom link, if people can't come, doesn't have to come till 48 hours prior. Great. I think that's what I was trying to say. You're at priorities and goals. Is your mic on? No, sorry. In terms of dealing with priorities and goals, our last agenda item, um, do people have priorities and goals they want to lay out and then we'll discuss each or how would you like to do it? That's the only thing that I can say off the top of my head. And I can start with some. Um, okay. So um, I have four um, possible priorities listed here. One is this whole question of education about human rights. What are human rights? So people understand that it applies to everyone and then the whole education piece about it and all the stuff that needs to be done. So I would imagine some kind of goal setting about human rights. Um, the second thing is that, um, you know, we it's about CSS, JC, and CRESS. Um, I think, I'm not sure how we want to get involved, but one goal might be there because there's a lot of distress. And certainly I keep getting emails on a personal level about going to those meetings and speaking up. And I know there's a lot of concern um, and we've, HRC has long had a close relationship with CSSJC. Um, the third thing, oh, the increasing the age of adults, we've already addressed that. And the fourth thing was this whole question of voting, um, that we have huge segments of our population who are refugees or other kinds of stateless people who are not participating in our local elections. Yes. So this whole question of, what sort of, that's more of an advocacy thing. We would have to advocate um, the barriers, not at the town level, it's at the state level. So we would have to take on an advocacy campaign at the state level to bring it to vote, um, to force our state representatives to vote for or against that kind of local vote. Okay, I'll, I'll... So I would suggest that we go around and say our items and then we can try to organize them and discuss them in, cl in clumps. Okay. I'll, I'll just start with uh, the fact that now we are electing or we actually choosing uh, fire uh, chief and then the superintendent for the schools and you know what Liz has also told uh, the middle school and so on. So I would really uh, promote us getting involved in it and being there when the decisions are being made and so on. This is the police chief or what chief? Police chief. Okay. Liz, do you want to go next? We'll just go down the line. 
Well, my two main prior three main priorities was the superintendent search, police chief, and CSSJC as it re um, relates to what's going on with Cress. I love when there's intersecting priorities. Um, my main priority was Cress, and the question I raised earlier about whether or not um, it's possible for us uh, to provide testimony for human rights issues. And I gave the example of the Indigenous Peoples Day, and there's, um, you know, a whole Indigenous rights agenda of uh, I think five pieces of legislation and other pieces about including um, factual education in public schools. I'm not sure of what the rest are at this moment, but that's just an example. So providing testimony in statewide legis uh, in the statewide legislature. The main thing that I'm, I'm interested in, in at the moment is about the police chief search. Um, just wanted more information about that. I guess um, uh, uh, coming from out of state, um, not really living here, holding that kind of college student role only here for four years, um, part of that is study abroad. Um, so I think like in terms of human rights priorities and goals um, and just thinking about how to get students more involved in that as well, um, because I know all of my close friends have no clue <laughs> about the commission um, and we've lived here for two years at this point. Um, and also just in general about town um, town, local politics, um, it's something only really, econ not economics, um, social jurisprudence and social thought uh, majors deal with, um, at Amherst College specifically. So that's like about 1800 students. Um, so I don't know, I guess for me, HRC priorities, I wanna get, the reason why I wanna take on this role is so I can get more exposure to things happening at the local level um, now that I'm, of age to vote. Um, so yeah, that's um, one of the things is sort of getting our initiatives more out there to people within my demographic. Okay, so um, the ones that have the most um, interest are the press CSSJC role and the police chief selection. So maybe we should outline what we can do with regard to those. Did you have a process in mind for this, Pamela? I'm just sort of taking over here. We didn't just No, 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 no. This is meant to be stuff. your retreat. So you have to take, I mean, you have to take the initiative about okay. where you want to go with this. Yeah. Okay. All right. So maybe we should talk about those first. Is that a good way to go, Liz? Um, Cress first and then the uh, police selection. Um, and the superintendent. I'm going tomorrow, to so say to... that me personally, that I think there's an intersection with the uh, CSSJC and Cress. Um, what's the word I'm looking for right now? Influx, flux, flux. You could say transition and transition. transition. And I think that it also because of where the crest came from, that they intersect with the police chief search. Yes, no, maybe. Okay, let's look at them together and have the superintendent search be a separate discussion then. Or are they, I was going to putting- That's in. just my opinion now. It doesn't have to be everybody's. Well, I'm making a proposal because I think we need to move forward. So shall we talk about those three together? Does that help you? Right now, when we're taking a look at all the stuff that's going on in the town um, and also with the school committee, those are the three things, press, um, superintendent, and police chief. Those are the three things on this list that is most prevalent in the folks that I talk to and what they are concerned about and have some um, tension about. Um, okay, so just to be clear, this is our goals and objectives for next year, and it 
ideally would align with right as it as it results as it pertains to how we're supporting the rights of the citizens of Amherst these are the things that folks are talking about these are the things that are in the newspaper right now these are the things that are um, need our immediate attention as a town these are the things that we're in in uh, an influx I don't know what the word I'm looking for we're fluxed about flexed about and they're urgent they need to happen sooner rather than later yes we have uh, an acting superintendent yes we have an acting police chief however we need I think as a council we need to be aware and more involved in how these processes are making the active more permanent and maybe um, help die down some of the tension and the um, the rhetoric and whatever else is going on in the minds of the folks that we need to most serve. Insecurity, I think. That's the good word. Girl, say that word, insecurity. That's a good word. I like it. So what are we going to do about it in the next year is the question. So remember, you need to have your mic. So what are we going to do about it is the question. That's so I do believe that you and me and or me was asked to be part of whatever the police search is um, as part of the Human Rights Commission. I think I got that and I'm not sure. And I know, I'm sorry that I got some information, uh, some emails from Paul at the beginning of September and then my sister passed away. So I was just like, I've been on. And then since then I've had five more deaths in three weeks period. So I have been not paying attention. And now I'm actually receiving text messages about um, our beloved Barry Brooks and his um, memorial cool. service. There's a gentleman um, in our town, his name is Barry Brooks Sr. He is an instrumental part of the African-American experience in the town of Amherst. He it was um, a guidance counselor, and then as a retired, he was an ombudsman for the regional schools. He was a guidance counselor at the middle school. He raised two children here. He was he and his wife, his wife Judy, was a beloved um, first grade teacher at Pelham Elementary School. Um, Judy belonged to Goodwin Memorial Amy Zion Church. Barry belonged to Grace Episcopal Church. Um, they uh, were also resident directors for many years at the in the ABC program. They are pillars of our community. Judy passed away several years ago. Barry passed away last week. Um, so right now, I'm in the process of helping his daughter in part of our um, Goodwin Memorial community plan um, his very public memorial service that will be on October 28th. So... Given that, I also lost my sister on September 8th and some other folks in between. Um, I also just um, moderated the memorial service of Dennis Jackson, who was another African-American man and a pillar in our community, especially when it comes to education and um, um, growth in youth empowerment. Um, and his memorial service was Friday, Friday night. So... Um, I haven't really been paying attention to um, the police chief search. And now I am telling you in person and on air that I am now back in that fold. Um, so, um, and as a member of the Amherst Regional School District since November of 1981, um, I'm very much interested in the superintendent search. So, I don't know how we as a group um, do these things. I know that we've been asked to be a part of the police chief search. So. So I, I'm going to suggestion that I um, fill you in uh, on information. I can fill you in on, on information about Crest, definitely. Um, and also the police chief search and also suggestions. So the CSSJC had requested specific information about the police chief search, which we provided them some written documents. So Jennifer can make arrangements to send that information to you. 
and she may be able to fill in more information. But what I understand is that following the first round of uh, public forums about the selection of the police chief, uh, that the consultants inform the town manager that there is a, a need for more information gathering. So they are, uh, I think, going to um, gather some more information from individuals in the community. And um, at the point in, in time when a search committee is formed, that it would include a member from this committee and a member from the CSSJC when the actual work of selecting a police chief occurs. And Jennifer, please fill in if you have more details. So I have a question. So I, I want to see if you all did, I know that everyone on the Human Rights Commission was invited to meet with the consultant. Did anyone else meet with them? I, I mean, apart from the two of us, you did. Did you meet no. with them? Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Well, since you've already met with them, first of all, I was going to say, well, since you've been out of commission, you should meet with them, but you already did. So that's fantastic. So never mind. I think, um, I don't know if I was allowed to, since I wasn't sworn in yet as a member. Have you been sworn so, in now? Then you're allowed to now. Can yeah. we get her on the list? Since there's... I think, huh? yeah, you just replied to the email. I would like to say that in the course of my interview with the person, it didn't happen at all like an, a structured information gathering session. Like there was no introduction that said, this is what is this, here's the process. First we're talking to you, then this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. There did not seem to be an order to the conversation. So it sort of doesn't surprise me that they come back and say they need to talk to more people. I wonder if we could somehow ask for them to be a little more structured in their questions or if they're unstructured still follow some thread because there wasn't any, which made me deeply concerned. And their own role, they said, um, seemed temporary and uncertain. So they said, you know, I said, what are you going to do with this information? Like there was no discussion of what they would do with the information. Is it confidential? Will you be quoted in the report? None of that was presented. And when I asked them, they said that they would, um, report their findings to the um, town to the town manager. And when I asked about, well, what do you mean by that? How are you going to analyze this qualitative data? They gave me no, um, the person I, who interviewed me gave me no, was not able to talk about how they were going to analyze. She said, oh, we'll do the main points. So I said, so what about all the minority comments, the comments that are not among these main points. Will they be included in an appendix or will they be left out or is it just the main points? And she, then she didn't seem to know. She said, oh, we'll include everything. So I said, well, you're going to include everything everybody says. So how then are you going to analyze what everybody says? And really it's possible that I was being difficult in the way I was asking my question because I work with qualitative data myself and I know it's very easy to fudge it. So I felt very concerned um, about the way, the loose way in which they were dealing with the information they were getting. Um, and the fact that there's no end to their involvement also concerned me. One thing, Pamela, that would help me a lot is to know like, what's the plan? Like, is is the idea that at the end of one year, there will be a new police chief or at X point, they didn't even, they said the town was going to develop the job description, not them. Um, so I can see them submitting a bunch of information to the town about, you know, people are concerned about, you know, they want cooperation with Cress, they want this, they want that, they don't want gun use, they want a gentle touch with young people, particularly BIPOC youth. So I don't know how all that necessarily changes anything about a job description that could be written today. And they also said that the town, this is my last point, the town does not have the money 
they said, oh, don't feel bad. You know, it's not like, it's not the town's fault that we're, she didn't use this term, but I'll say in disarray, she says, it's not the town's fault. They don't have the money. But I find that hard. Yeah, I, I can I be talking to? Can I finish? Who are you interacting with? The person, the person who I was asked to do my interview with, the consultant who's doing the police search. Okay. So it seems to me that's not acceptable because we don't have a police chief for one whole year, which means we have a year of the police chief's salary that remain that was allocated, but is available potentially for this. So to then say, not to speak of whatever budget HR has for hiring, but then to it doesn't seem believable to me that there's no money to hire a new police chief, such an important position in this town. Um, so anyway, I, I left feeling very um, sort of saddened by it because I think it's an opportunity, especially when you're willing to be open. And I have the sense from everything I've heard that everybody wants, you know, a good police chief who can work with press and, you know, be legitimate, have legitimacy in this very diverse community with a lot of concerns. So I know everybody wants that. But I felt disheartened uh, from what I heard. That's just my report of my interaction in responding to the town manager's email to all of us about signing up to talk to the consultant. I just want to say that I had a very different experience than you had. Um, I was able to say all the things that I wanted and needed to say. I was able to get some um, answers to the direct questions that I had about what the next steps were going to be. And just to clarify, we do have a police chief right now. It's acting, but we do have a police chief. Yeah, I also had a great experience in my interview. Um, although the one uh, thing that- Is your mic on? It is. I had a great experience in my interview. And the one thing that was the same, Ronnie, is what you experienced is um, they didn't have an end game in terms of like, here's the 12 steps from talking to you to hiring this police chief. Um, because what, and what they, I was explicitly told is their end game in this moment is writing the report from the data collection. And then the town would make a decision about what happens after that. So that seems like it might be similar to what you had. So I would love, Pamela, if you have more information about the sequencing of uh, this process, that'd be great. So I don't have uh, a lot of information because I haven't been involved um, in the process. Uh, it is my understanding that this first phase would be completed and then the um, the second stage would be the formation of the search committee. And I, I'm, I'm not certain whether responsibility for writing the job description would lie with the consultants or whether that would be in-house by the HR um, department. I'm, I'm not, I'm not certain. So as far as we are concerned, as far as we're concerned, the next step for that we where we can be involved is to have one representative on the actual search committee. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Yes, one invitation from from here. Point of clarification: Is the search committee and the interview committee going to be two separate pe groups or one group? No, or do I, we not know that? I think that it's one group. When I when I'm saying the um, using the term uh, search committee, I think that was the body of uh, of people who would review applications and interview. But again, you know, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt because I haven't been intimately involved in the process, but it's my understanding that you would be, a member of this group would be on the deciding, um, among those individuals who be, would be making a recommendation to the town manager. And I'm gonna assume that uh, all the information that is shared within the search committee cannot be shared outside right. of it because these are personnel matters. And so we can't know who, the, who all the candidates are and what the criteria are. So to the extent that people have prioritized the police chief's search as connecting to the commission, besides having a member of our commission on the search committee, is there any other way we could possibly be involved? 
So uh, I, oh. So when we were selecting a principal, um, there was the search committee and the interview committee, and then the candidates came to the school and met with kids and staff. And so I'm not sure that that's a true statement. And if it is a true statement, then I, for one, will bring up how before there's a final um, selection made that members of the community should be able to meet and greet and pick their brain. And, you know, um, we was also able to, even though we did not have a final say because I wasn't on the search, I was able to put my suggestions and my thoughts and feelings in a little box for people to review. Great. Great. Yes. Um, what I was thinking is like, if you get uh, 50 applications, that that information does not get shared widely. But once you have like three finalists, perhaps, then what you're talking about can kick in. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'd like to add just completing the earlier discussion that I did get to say everything I wanted to say. And I think she, I think the person interviewing me did hear me. I, what I was reacting to was my questions to her, my questions to her about what her purpose was and how the information collected from me would be used. Okay, it, um, so before we move on to Crest, do you need to have any further conversation or take any action or are you satisfied with that? Well, I wanna okay. make sure that what Liz suggested, which is that there's a role for us as a, body to uh, meet with the finalists or you know give input to vet them and give input at least All right. so where would where would we go to or who would be what do we need to do to ensure that the commission <clears throat> can be more fully involved so I, I can inquire about more details of the process from the town manager I just I personally just don't know the answer to that question right now. I do think that the process that Liz described is the process that would be used going forward, but I don't, you know, I cannot um, say that with 100% authority. All right, so you can find out and get back to us. And if this is not the process, uh, what would be our process for advocating for that? Yeah, so I think um, your your process for advocating is always um, you have an advisory role to the town manager, so you could send a letter or memorandum um, advising so, um, and you also have that advisory role to the town council, so you could do that as well. But I uh, I would love the opportunity just to find out some more clarity about the. So the next most important agenda is, um, or equally important agenda, I will say that, is um, CRESS. CRESS. So I can give you lots of information about CRESS. So um, the town manager met with his executive leadership team, I think now like three or four weeks ago, um, and um, to have a discussion about setting up an interim leadership team for the CRESS department. And uh, at the conclusion of uh, that meeting, which was on a Friday, I was told that I should think about taking on that, uh, taking on the that interim director role. Uh, when I met with the town manager the following Monday, I I laid out to him or discussed with him what I thought would be really important scaffolding to put in place in order for me to do that, which was to create a leadership team. Um, because I do not have public safety uh, as an expertise. And so the leadership team includes Chief Nelson the fire of the fire department, um, Sergeant Janet Griffin from the police department, myself and Kat Newman um, from the Crest department. Kat has served in several roles in Crest. So she was a program assistant, which was a union position which was um, envisioned as uh, the second to Earl um, or to the director's position. And she is currently serving as the implementation, the grant implementation manager. So um, uh, at the time that the director left the position um, or was placed on leave, um, the 
uh, program assistant position also became vacant. That person resigned. So there was definitely a leadership void over in the department. The, um, the implementation um, leadership team has now been in uh, effect for three weeks. We met with all the responders in the first for our first day that we took over the role and had a full one day retreat where we um, reviewed the the mission and goals of the department. I, I, I think uh, hopefully they would agree with me when I said that within the department, there's there had been a little bit of like um, mission uh, drift, right? That what people thought that they were uh, hired to do and what they were doing, there was a little bit of a gap. And so um, each of the um, responders was asked to describe their work in um, one to three sentences. And then as a group, we created um, a, a very brief mission statement that looked at what the actual mission of the department should be. Uh, we also, we, meaning the leadership team, have also um, put in some structure, I think, to help the department during this interim period. So uh, Janet, uh, Kat, and I are on site. The DEI office moved to the second floor of the bank, so we are all there. So uh, Janet, Kat, and I meet um, every morning at 8.15 to talk about the department. And then following that, we uh, try to have a morning meeting every morning with the responders to review their activities and plans for, for the day. We have um, tried to designate uh, Tuesdays as an in-service day where they are starting to receive training on, and refresher information on a variety of different topics. Um, we have um, tried to get um, uh, have them begin to use more formally the use of their radios, calling in, following procedures around um, how they record their calls. We're reviewing policy. Um, we're making some recommendations. We, again, the leadership team, are making some recommendations for about the structure going forward. The um, the intent is that this is a temporary leadership team, not meant to be in there permanently. In fact, I've said at every meeting, it is my goal not to be in this role come January 2nd. Like I'm only guaranteeing um, my participation through the end of the year. So the town needs to move quickly to decide uh, what future structure will be. Um, as the town manager pointed out in the documents that we'll have um, Jennifer share with the group, this leadership team looks very similar to the implementation team, which included members of fire, um, police department, uh, Jennifer's role as the um, in the as the DEI. Um, um, so it's sort of a similar structure. I I. I would hope that if you spoke with the responders that they would feel that we are trying to listen to concerns that they have about how the department has operated go, um, in the past and we're trying to address some of those concerns. I would say from a management perspective, we've also sort of tried to address some of the concerns that management had as far as um, uh, wearing identify, I, I don't want to call it a uniform because it's not a full uniform, but having people show up to work and their crest identifiable, um, um, you know, uh, shirts and apparel so that you know that um, they are crest responders. And one of the things that I've tried to do is model that. So if you see me Monday through Friday, I'm wearing a gray crest uh, shirt. Um, so to model that expectation. Um, we did unfortunately have um, two responders resign. No one has been to One individual um, has taken an opportunity at um, within the school department. The other person, you know, I don't know, but you would, you know, if if you knew who they were, you'd have to ask them specifically about their rationale them um, for- Do we for, have the right to know who they are? No. 
Yeah. Well, generally personnel matters. We wouldn't, you know, yeah. But um, so the, I think that the group um, that remain um, are still very committed to the work. Um, there is still some discussion about what that work is. Um, there have been some obstacles that the town is moving to overcome as far as like uh, the concern that they're not re that the responders are not receiving calls from the um, 911 dispatch system yet. Um, but there were some legal obstacles as far as uh, collective bargaining with the dispatch union that have been um, have been mostly resolved. And so things are moving along um, in that way. On Friday, uh, or earlier la during the week last week, I received a, a call from their union representative um, who wanted to just check in on the status of the, of the leadership of the department. We arranged for the union rep to meet the entire leadership team. So we were on a Zoom call with him, answered any questions that he had, and then left that meeting so that he could have a private meeting with um, the responders so that they have an opportunity to you know, raise their issues. Um, the trainings that are the in-service that have taken place thus far was um, a refresher with um, uh, the dispatch um, department um, and a training that was on domestic uh, partner violence. And then uh, two responders and Janet um, uh, both participated in a two day workshop around um, suicide prevention and working with youth around a number of issues. So um, the, we've asked the responders to provide us with a list of um, requests for things that they would like to have more information on or have a refresher, and they've done so. Um, we met with them on Friday afternoon to go over, um, a, have a, a group discussion about professional goals, both short-term and long-term, as well as educational attainment. So I think uh, we're trying to be as supportive as we can and to have the um, have the department in a position where there will be an easy uh, pass um, of passing of the baton to whomever next directs the department. Yeah. Well, thank you for that update. Does anybody have any questions? I know I just have one. Okay. Yeah. The fact that we're not sure as to why this happened, that there's the vacuum at the top, you know, the crest, in crest, uh, and I don't know, and there is a lot of privacy around that also, but uh, how can we be sure that it won't happen again? So I think the answer is that you can never be sure that there won't be some sort of issue that might come up. Um, but because it is a personnel matter, we're not allowed to really discuss that in, in full. I, I think you can, um, and the, uh, the town manager in his conversation with the town council reiterated his commitment to seeing the department be successful. Uh, I think uh, you can, you know, you would have to take him as his word that that is true. I think that the the members of the leadership team certainly are all there to make sure that the department is successful. When I spoke publicly about the leadership team for the on the first opportunity was at the last September meeting of the um, a CSSJC. I said, you know, I am late in my career. I did not sign on to this task to be a part of something that is um, doesn't needed to be a failure. My goal in taking on the role is to for it to be successful. I was adamant, so I take all praise and criticism together about the formation of a leadership team because the idea of me being in charge of this department without any public safety background would just be, in my uh, opinion, nonsense. Um, and so the goal is to put together a team that can really provide the structure for that um, easy handoff. So that has required like looking at the 
current um, policies and procedures that were in place about in making sure that the responders understand the difference between labor and management and how what rights they have as part of being a part of a collective bargaining unit. I mean, there's some real, um, I guess, complexities because they are part of the same union that the dispatchers on. And normally when I think, or it's easier for you to envision like resolving collective bargaining uh, disputes when people are uh, working in different unions, right? And so you have to reconcile between the two. They are actually in the same union as the dispatchers. So there's a lot of nuance to, um, to having that conversation. And then of course, add onto that, that there are two unions for fire and two unions for the police department. And all of them have to interact with the CRESS responders. So as I said to the responders as well, and to the CSSJC, if you can envision a way in which this department would work without having strong relationships with those other departments, then you know please let me know. But I think we need to establish strong relationships between all three public safety um, departments in the town. The other thing I think that's important to know, so uh, we, uh, the Crest Department recently, like a lot of their funding is coming from the Department of Mental Health. They recently did a site visit. I think they were fairly pleased with what they learned about this interim um, transition leadership team. Um, we'll hear back from them if they have concerns. Uh, the department, um, um, under the leadership of the prior director had applied uh, at least twice before to be a part of a government leadership lab through the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, this past spring, they were awarded that um, non-financial grant to be a part of this government lab. So all of the members of the leadership team uh, and I will be meeting with this um, cohort. And the cohort is a group of other um, um, responder type uh, departments across the country to learn from each other and to get advice about how to move the department uh, forward. And this, you know, as you saw, if you read in the paper, right, each city and municipality is making their own decisions about where best to house this type of work if they want to do it. And Northampton is being housed in, um, you know, in the public health department. And some places it's embedded in fire and other places it's embedded in the police department. And here the town had previously decided that it would be a standalone, you know, department, a third public safety department. Okay, Deborah had a question as well. Yeah, actually I have a comment and a question. This far precedes your involvement. Um, I just wanna say that, uh, I understand collective bargaining complexities. I used to be a staff person at a labor union and my job was to negotiate collective bargaining agreements. Um, but I have to go on record as saying that I'm very frustrated that people were hired and the staff was, you know, the department was created without having those issues resolved first because core to their mission is to be getting these 911 calls. So I'm just very mm, frustrated. Maybe I'm even a little aggravated by that. So it has, there's nothing for you to respond. I just want to say that because um, the, what has happened is the trust and credibility and um, excitement and hope for this department has been so greatly diminished far before, you know, the director was put on admin leave. So I just want to say that. Um, I also am frustrated and concerned at how long this administrative leave has been dragging on. And I think that, um, you know, whoever is accused of anything needs to have their due process, but to have such a tiny department lose its head and have, you know, be in the position of needing to have interim um, and have no hope in sight for when another search process is gonna happen or when he's gonna be returning further diminishes the trust and faith and hope and credibility of the department. All of that has nothing to do with you. <laughs> so uh, I totally agree with you. I feel like the legal um, questions should have been answered well before they were sworn in, but all of that history predates me and I don't know why decisions were made. Um, I, I just don't have any idea. 
Uh, I do think that um, the town has been working probably uh, not at a pace that is visible to members of the public on the aspect around the paid administrative leave and coming some to some resolution. But um, I think, as you know, like it, those things tend to take time. The town did hire an independent investigator to um, investigate the matter. And so all of that takes time and then there's just a process involved in doing it. Um. You go ahead, because I have to digest what I'm she just said. Just uh, given everything that you've said, given everything that you've said, I'm just wondering, um, you know, apart from the disappointment that many people, including myself, feel about Cress and sort of, anyway, my question to you is, given that you are now, have now become quite familiar with Cress and what it has to offer, and you know the HRC really well. I'm just wondering, where do you see the windows of opportunity for us to be involved? So I, I actually, um, Rizwana had a really good suggestion that I wrote down when you asked the question earlier about um, uh, Crest taking on the role of helping people to walk through some of the processes or having some um, um, involvement in that. I, I don't know the complete answer to that because I think uh, right now I would say that the the majority of the responders are taking on the role of gaps in social service agencies. So they've been very helpful with working with seniors. The inspection department has asked them to assist with um, um, individuals in town who are subject to eviction because of hoarding. But that is not what was envisioned as the primary work of the department. And so I see that once the department starts to receive 911 calls, their, um, their work and the ability to do those things will be shifted quite a bit. Um, and I, I think it, you know, it is yet to be seen what the demand will be for response to 911 calls and what their capacity is. I, I mean, I have lots of thoughts in my head that are, I have said to the town manager, my goal is to provide um, a re, you know, a pretty comprehensive report of like what we've done during this interim period, as well as future suggestions, but they will be, you know, they, they're, they're I, I've described them as wild ideas. So um, I'll just say like publicly, one of my wild ideas is that I think that the Crest Department, even if it is a standalone department, should probably um, have space in the new fire department that is um, going to be built in, um, at some point in that building, right? So that there's a more intimate connection to um to one of the public safety departments. Um, you know, one of the I ideas that the responders floated themselves was whether they should receive training to become EMTs. I mean, so there are lots of good ideas floating around, but I, um, I don't know where the department will be in, you know, three years time or in five years time. So the way I see it from a human rights lens is that Part of the reason for Cress's formation was that there were violations of human rights being carried out by the police department. And there were a number of um, studies done prior to my move to Amherst, but I've read the studies. And they've all called for some sort of barrier between the police and their training and their particular way of responding, including the way they're socialized to respond. And the person on the other end. And it seems to me that Cress can get lost in all the needs of any society in America, like <clears throat> Hammerst, where there are huge disparities in healthcare and elder care in all kinds of fields. And what I see is that <clears throat> they're getting dis distracted by those true needs. However, 
addressing those needs is great. They're legitimate needs too. But in terms of the human rights violations that were occur occurring, some of them very blatant, particularly against BIPOC youth and or other BIPOCs people, um, I don't see, I mean, Crest was supposed to be that space. And my question is, what can we, <coughs> excuse me, what, if anything, what sort of role do we have to highlight the need for that barrier so that there's, it reduces the likelihood of violations occurring when there aren't many eyes on it, you know, on the event that's taking place where such violations occur. So I, I think that the, that the need for the barrier was well documented in the prior reports that you've talked about. And I think that the, um, that the responders, that is the re work that the responders really envision themselves doing. Um, the primary um, obstacle to doing that work has been receiving calls through the 911 system. At least in my opinion, I would say that's been the primary block. And then, um, so overcoming that obstacle will, I, I think, lead to uh, more responders being able to do that type of work. And that's why I say I would be reluctant to say, oh, the um, you know the responders will be able to do X, Y, and Z with the HRC, because I think when they are fully uh, designated and um, able to do the work as it was envisioned for them, they will not have the time to do some of the social service uh, type of actions they've been in. Basically, I'd like to share my own experience with Chris because uh, that reflects very well and uh, positively, it reflects positive uh, impact that they made on my life because I had just entered this community, Amherst, and uh, I had bought a car and it turned out to be Lemon Law. I was dealing with a local, you know, garage and uh, they you know they were not they were very uh, and if I had I known I would have come here because they were very uh, there was a racial intonations and they were really treating they were very aggressive my um, you know the uh, seller car sales people so I don't want to take their names but um, I did get a loss also on that and they did everything illegal so how I got to get Chris involved was because they were in the library at the time and I frequently went there and they were very nice and very cordial and I got to know them just saying hi and so on and then uh, they I said you have this badge you know you have this crest and they said yes because we are doing this there was Q there and then uh, I think Brittany was there so they actually were so good they said no we are going to go with you we will accompany you because I didn't have any male person. So there was this underlying gender issue also going on because I am coming, I am a stranger. I'm coming out of the community, the gender, there's a, there's a misogyny going on there. And uh, um, they went with me and then um, the person, you know, my, because um, the, the seller, he said, uh, who was supposed to give me return my money that was uh, substantial for me at that time and because the car was junk. So um, the Chris Q said, no, we will come back again with you. So after a couple of hours, they accompanied me again because they knew that it was unsafe place for me, that, that business was very unsafe for me. And I felt also very threatened. So I did not register the complaint here because again, the process of complaint is, has not been uh, implemented. So the Crest people helped me, but I wish I had known that I could go further and take it along because I didn't want to go into the small courts claim. I went through the attorney general and she followed up and I was right. I, was, I had the money hinged onto it, but they did not even deem necessary to call back or even do anything. And this is a very old business on the main street, on the Pleasant Street. It's a garage. And so in the end, nothing came out. As you say, there was no mediation, but the Crest people did protect me. So I have to let you know that. So I would say that um, 
that the CRESS responders, the work that they are doing that has been in that more social services um, realm is very uh, meaningful and impactful for those individuals. And I should also point out that the department has a memorandum of understanding to work with the schools. So there are a couple of initiatives that they're doing with the schools um, and that um, the department does have a presence in the library and um, the plans are that they would have some office space uh, in, the, in the library. So one of the issues that came up um, and just reviewing the work over the last few weeks is that you know, at at one point the um, department we had there had two shifts of working from eight to four and then from twelve to eight, um, but that the department is in the bang center and that building is closed at four. So you had uh, responders who were in a building that was really locked away after four p.m. And although there are notices on the doors, you know, call this number. Right, you didn't have um, access to them. And so one of the suggestions that I would um, say going forward would be that, um, you know, if there's a night shift that that uh, work should occur at the location of the library, which is open to the public, right? So that you would have people have actually have access to, to responders. So the, the plan is um, at the conclusion of this interim leadership to provide all of this information to the town manager and to whomever is gonna be in the future leadership role for them to make ultimate decisions. Right now we have three responder positions that are open. Um, I had said at the very beginning that taking on the interim role that I really did not want to hire, right? I think that should be a decision for the uh, next uh, director. However, because we have, uh, we only have two complete teams and one team that um, only has one member, we will probably hire one responder so that we have three complete um, teams. Well, you actually answered my question, which is, are we filling the vacancies? That is the question. It's written right there in black and white. Now, then, so I will move on to my comment, and it has to do with the part about um, our past director, or our current director, being on administrative leave. And that comment is that it's taken me aback a little bit about um, money. I'm going back to money because we have him on administrative leave. We have raised my taxes for the building of a new school. I fully supported that, okay? I want everybody to know I fully support that. But it seems to me that we are spending money on events that are tearing us apart as opposed to bringing us together. We have bought out the past superintendent. We have folks from the middle school that are under investigation and on paid leave. We have a crest director on paid leave. And I know the different parts, part, pockets of money come from different places, but I think it's ironic that we have this money to put folks on a leave while we're doing these extensive investigations but we don't have money to fund the events that bring us all together as a community. I think that that's ironic and we need to fix that quickly. Not us, I'm talking about the town, by the way. <laughs> so I think we're back to this question of how to prioritize our goals for next, for this coming year? Like, what are we going to really focus our energies on? Um, we seem to have talked quite a bit about this, so may maybe we should talk about some of the other things so we can actually come up with things we can do. So I'm looking quite at- done with CRESS and CSS. Right, so those are two priorities, is to keep those in the forefront of every conversation. I think we need to have updates on them at each of our meetings. I think that one of us needs to be on the police search and the superintendent search. And these are the three items, press, superintendent, and police chief that we discuss each month. Um, also, I'm in, in um, 
education about human rights. I think that we need to develop Jennifer some kind of pamphlet or something. I think we talked about this a little earlier and also how to incorporate um, the rights of our students as they navigate our town in the few years that they're here. Um, they may not want to. I do, we have a student here that's very interested in that. And I think we need to support her and that mission. Um, and do they know some of the things? I know that UMass has a department over there, do they not? That helps students navigate things that may come up when it comes to their human rights. I'm not sure if Amherst College does. Um <clears throat> Amherst College, like a lot of the like s routes that you can go to um when it comes to like a couple of human rights violations like sexual assault, um uh discrimination, they're all sort of combined into like Title IX. Um the per the person who represents that um Title IX board or whatever. Um and a lot of students have their own anecdotal te testimonies having really bad experiences. Um, and then Amherst tries a lot to deal with sort of on-campus on campus incidents. Like there was recently a um, anti-Black racist um, slur that was spray painted on one of the columns at a um, dorm on campus. Um, and so they sort of sent out, they just sent out a statement saying that they're trying to you know, make amends with the situation um, and that they're really upset about it, but it's a lot of statements um, and then kind of continuously just kind of brushing things under the rug, like never hear about it. You never hear about the investigation um, or who's held accountable. So there are a lot of things happening on campus that students are aware of. And then a lot of these conversations happen in affinity groups um, about, you know, like, I feel uncomfortable, but they're not often had with actual people that can make disciplinary action um, or any other action of that sort. So I guess to me, it seems really important uh, specifically with the police chief serve, uh, search because there we have our own like, um, well, actually, I don't know, but how the different um, Amherst police departments work. I know there's like town of Amherst and then there's one more that's slightly bigger. We have town of Amherst, you have oh. UMass police and you also have a police ACC. department on Amherst College. As yeah. Well. So Amherst and they interface with each other mostly when there's off campus entities. However, I know that for UMass, sometimes if something is large, they'll call an AP the Amherst police department to come over and assist with that. Yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry. So I was just going to add that both for UMass and for Amherst College, uh, there is a state statute which allows them to have full police power. So they are considered like a city police department for the campus. Um, so they operate just like a municipal the police department would. Yeah. And so I feel like um, a lot of students have brought forth that like BIPOC specifically um, when they feel like they're being um, intimidated by a police officer on Amherst College. And so we had, there's been a large ongoing conversation that often never gets solved because students are filtered out so quickly in the system, um, especially since COVID, now that um, students are not in, I mean, I think it was really um, intense during COVID just because there was so much policing in general um, about like, quarantine and everything but I know um now that like more social gatherings are happening there there still can be incidents um but I don't think people know how that those situations can um inspire more change um and so I feel like a lot of those conversations stay within the affinity groups and kind of have like a social um so would it be would um, that be a Go ahead. I was wondering if there would be room um, for us as a, yes. an organization exactly. to go over to the campus and do some kind of workshop with the students around human rights and taking some of our documents over and talking about the laws as they pertain to their human rights and or 
answer any questions that they may have. Um, are they invited to our meetings? Are the students inviting to? Does the campus get um, notification that there's a human rights meeting happening on this date and they can come in and have public comment? Um, things like that would be a way that we can move forward. Um, and when is Human Rights Day or Human Rights? December 10th. December. Universal and, Declaration of Human Rights, you mean? Yeah, and maybe we can um, go over to your campus on that day or a couple of days leading up to that or maybe even a day or two after that and talk to your students about his, the rights you have as students. I, we have to be careful because I think Amherst College is private <laughs> as opposed to UMass, which is public. So we'd have to weigh carefully as to, we'd have to be invited actually. So that would start with you, I think. I also wonder if, these discussions that happen in these little affinity groups, those concerns, if those issues can be brought to a higher level if somebody were to file a complaint with the Human Rights Commission, because then there would be a way um, just to raise it to a higher level so that the authorities realize it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, I think that uh, what's not clear to many people, and even Cress didn't think to send Rizwana to the Human Rights Commission, but it seems like we really do need to spread the word that the commission is here, if not to solve a particular problem at, the, at that point, to elevate it to a higher level of attention while preserving the complainant's um, confidentiality. Yeah, so I feel like the conversation about CREST was really illuminating, especially because um, I didn't know what that acronym stand, stood for. Um, I haven't heard of that organization, um, but reading like a little bit about it, it already seems like um, like it would alleviate situations that could escalate with a police officer um, or help when there is a police officer to provide support for stu for people who are shaken in those situations. Um, or like if you get pulled over, you can call Crest to let them know that you have been pulled over um, and that there is a police al like altercation. And even if it doesn't escalate, just having someone to go to in case a situation like that, that's really traumatizing for a lot of people. Um, but I know that I I've never heard of it and I don't think Amherst has done enough to, you know, even acknowledge the fact that there's this organization that's trying to partner with. So um, Cress would not currently have the authority to enter onto Amherst College since it's a private university, right? And you have your own rules and regulations and policies and your own police department. I do would say that, uh, you know, one of my recommendations for the town in the future would be to think about the growth opportunity for the department if it were able to enter into memorandums of understanding with uh, UMass, with Hampshire, and with Amherst College, but that doesn't currently exist, so they wouldn't have authority to be uh, on campus. There were um, uh, UMass students who were very interested in having UMass um, create a crust-like department for the university, so you know, there there may be a growth opportunity for the department um, and the town in the future, but that doesn't doesn't cur currently exist. Um, one other thing that I want to say before I forget is that so um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights takes place on December 10th. The town common is going to be under construction. So Jennifer and I um, uh, discussed and have sort of thought about uh, moving that. Uh, uh, celebration to the courtyard at the Bang Center for a candlelight light um, candlelight lighting event and then moving the reading of the Declaration of Human Rights indoors to the room 101 which is right adjacent to the courtyard at the banks and the day um, the next day on December 11th, the um, Mass Commission Against Discrimination representatives will be here to do a Know Your Rights uh, workshop, um, and they will provide uh, translation services in Spanish. So that's in the works for that event. Could I, uh, before we lose um, 
uh, Jacinta's issue altogether. I, could I clear, could we clarify that Amher students can still file a complaint with the Human Rights Commission? They can't access CRESS, but if they want to file a complaint confidentially like anybody else in the, within the bounds of the city of Amherst, they can file a complaint. If they feel I definitely want to learn more them. about how the town and like um, Amherst work in terms of like policy. So in general, um, uh, colleges and universities may maintain authority over their campuses. So while it's true, an Amherst College student could file a complaint with the Human Rights Commission, um, the town itself would not have the authority to dictate a change in Amherst College policy or you know, actions because of the private nature. However, as uh, Ronnie has pointed out, it does elevate the profile of the complaint. Complaining about an Amherst business, right? A business that lies with outside of Amherst College, which we then would be able to help and support. And you also might want to check in with Sarah Barr because she is the... Uh, what is the proper word that I'm looking for? Um, Nancy and Tony are our town gown representatives for UMass and Amherst, and Sarah is our town gown representative for Amherst College. Do you know? I don't know if you know Sarah Barr or not, but and I know that with like when we send things out saying like we're going to have these events or that events that Sarah Barr actually takes that and forwards it to the community at Amherst College. So I know recently Amherst Rec did it for the block party and Sarah, they were able to get multiple people who came in and did face painting for the youth. Can I just, for the kids. just let Deborah speak for just one second, please? I need to go and I'm going off the mic right now. So it's really hard to follow that and be present. That's um, but I'm looking at the time, and I'm looking at the fact that at least three of us have another um event to go to shortly after we dismiss. So I've been taking some notes a little bit about um some of our priorities. Um, the one was to plan a human rights information and or workshop at Amherst College. However, I do believe that we can invite your folks here for the MCAD workshops that are happening on December 11th. So that's a priority. And um, if we can help you um, get some flyers or whatever to put around campus so that we know that that's available and maybe even UMass and Hampshire College. Um, so that the students can be present um, if they wish to be um, at that at that um, event on December 11th. I also wrote as part of our one of our charges is to follow up on um, press and keep that um, as an agenda item for each of our meetings. Um, a member of this committee or members of this committee being on the police chief search. I also wrote members of this committee being on the superintendent search. I wrote meet with the town council regarding the budget. Um, and I wrote um, trying to get a pamphlet um, regarding the HRC and as it in education about human rights being as part of that pamphlet. So education about human rights and what this commission actually is about being as part of that pamphlet. So those are the ones that we've already discussed. I'm sure that we have 
some other things. There are other things on this agenda that we haven't gotten to, but I also know it's 20 minutes to four and we have already worked through lunch and we have a four o'clock deadline, so. Um, one thing we didn't discuss and I'm happy having it uh, postponed to our, put, put on our next meeting's agenda is this question of whether we want to advocate for voting rights or that part of our mandate for residents of Amherst. Obviously it won't apply to this year's election, but if we did, um, it would be something that would be relevant for two years from now. Yes, and I'm you know agreeing with you. That is more of a statewide thing as opposed mm -hmm. to just an Amherst thing. So we'd have to take a, lot, a hard look at that. I mean, we can advocate for the other folks in Amherst, but we'd have to also interface with our state when it comes to that. Right. But we are advocating for folks yeah. in Amherst to be able to uh, to vote. I agree. Um, okay. All right. It seems like that covers it. Yeah. it in terms of what we're doing, I don't see like big priorities and I see that priorities might shift depending for instance on how Crest goes. And uh, the thing that I see as the priority that we all agreed to is having us pick out um, committees that we think we wanna take a more active role in and then making it official so that we can then join those committees or just go and listen to what's happening and come back and report as our way of connecting and also um, maybe speaking at those committees to let people know that we exist and what we do and how to get more information about our about us. So that would be my last thought. So maybe we should go around and have some last thoughts before we uh, leave. Is that well, okay? according to our um, agenda, we should public. open it up again for public comment. Then we have Amendment. member reports and then any other topics we did not think about. So that's why we have 20 minutes for that. And maybe we can take five or 10 minutes for that and then go around with final thoughts from each of the commissioners, if that's okay with you, Pamela. So oh, uh, do we have anybody in the public's? Well, while he's not speaking, I do wanna say that he is our wingman when it comes to lifting and bending when we have events because he's he gets put to work <laughs> um hrc member reports um i think the biggest report is that the cssjc is having a meeting on tuesday at 6 30 they're not having a meeting anymore is that the 11th whenever the 11th is wednesday at 6.30, um, their primary um, goal is discuss uh, the discussion of CRESS. So if people want more information about CRESS or more in depth, I'm not sure exactly where they're going with it. I was just invited to come to the meeting, so. And they're posting it the Friday, the Zoom. The meeting has already been posted for Wednesday. No, no, they have, the meeting have the is meeting, but if you go to the town calendar at Amherst MA, I mean, that's something else that we should probably do at your next meeting and show you guys how to utilize the town calendar. So, or the town website. So if you go to amherstma.gov on the scroll down to the calendars for the 11th, there'll be a Zoom link attached to that. I could show it to you now if you needed to, but I think you actually got the. Actually, the hard part is not going to the calendar and finding the meeting. The hard part is if you miss the meeting and two days later you want to hear it, finding it is nearly impossible. Well, yep, because IT posts the meetings on Fridays. Next Friday, if I wanted to watch it and I hadn't attended, I could watch it there. Yep, you can always call and ask for us to send you a copy of it, too. Oh, okay. Thank you. So if I may, I will ask that um, the committee members take a look at the um, amherstmass.gov and take a look at which committees they are interested in um, attending and letting us know that on our next meeting, which is October 18th 
if that's okay. And also, what are they thinking about? Do they want to do which of the searches do you want to be a part of if we if you can? And how we then get that to the folks leading those searches, candidate searches. Um, so for those to be posted on our agenda for our next meeting. So um, I just want to um, interject for a moment to say that Wednesday the 11th is also the candidates night for potential candidates. So department heads will be here in town hall to meet with individuals who are running for office. Um, so I will not be in attendance at the CSSJC meeting, but in their current package, which is posted, you would find um, more information about press uh, at, um, as well as a DEI update. And um, the uh, I can't remember the title, so Jennifer, you'll have to tell me. The, one of the items on their agenda was um, concerning the um, co responder for lack of a better word at the police department can you just provide some information about that so the amherst police department for a few years has had a co-responder from cso which is clinical services option and so they've been working as the the mental health to help with folks who have mental health issues that the police interact with and so one of the things that are on the agenda for the CSSJC is that position and how it will interfect and how it almost mimics what they, I think, envision that Crest will be doing. So, yes. There was, there was a note, a request to a fairly broad listserv, I think. I don't know who all were on it, but I know it was a big listserv asking people to come to the next CSSJC meeting because they're going to be discussing CRESS. So if you're really interested, the next one is an important meeting to go to. Excuse me, I, to go when I checked their uh, meeting, they were discussing CRESS. So it was the whole time and they always, so they were always. CRESS is always on their agenda. So they request a monthly update on Crest and DEI. So it appears on their agenda every month. I'm just noting that there was a special email that went out of which I and I don't know how many dozens of people got that said, please come to the, to the CSSJC meeting next time. I I've also... never been to one before, although I've wanted to. So I don't know what goes on in general. So this... I also want to um, say that Ronnie's going to take the first stab at a letter to the town council so that we can meet with them regarding our budget or lack thereof. And that will be on our agenda, should be on our agenda for the next meeting as well. Um, And I'll do the email very quickly from the two of us with your approval to Lynn Griesmer, just asking who our liaison is. All right, so I have two agenda items for, um, and uh, I did not sure that I had captured everything, but um, town council budget, invitation to uh, the town manager, were there um, other things that were that I missed? I don't know. So the two agenda items that I re re, um, recorded for the 18th are um, budget, discussing the budget with town council and an invitation for the town manager to come to this meeting. Correct. Well, and the police chief search? Um, I was just saying that we need to, um, so members need to bring which, entities from the town government that they would like to be a sub part of that they also should be taking a look at which 
if they are available for the police chief search and the superintendent search. Um, of course, they will have an update on press for the next meeting. And Ronnie will have the two letters that she is drafting available for our next meeting. Did I miss anything, ladies and gentlemen in the back? One that I would like to get out just with the, the co-chair's approval and your advance approval is just the email requesting uh, information about who on the town council is our liaison. Um, yes. The other letter, the budget letter, will come to you uh, from both of us for approval next meeting. And we just want to make sure that we also approve for Jennifer to um, send our support to the um, increase of age, in the age of adulthood when it comes to legal issues. Um, I thank you all for um, today's wonderful discussion. Ditto. <laughs> so it's nice. It's nice hearing all the different things that we need to focus on for the coming year, and I look forward to working with everyone. It's always important to me to have a diverse group of people in here that come from different backgrounds discussing the same things. And sometimes we can get caught up in our own language, if you will. Um, but I think for the most part, we have all um, said some of the same things that are important um, to us and um, no judgment for anything. I think that a little bit of tension is good and um, I think we have a lot of work to do. And I think that we have a good start in some of the things that we find found that are important for us to um, work on in the next year to come. I'm really glad we had a chance to focus on sort of a few things to work on next year. And it's really helped me a lot to hear what's on other people's minds. I usually have very clear ideas myself. And it's important to have my ideas poked a little bit by others. And I appreciate that very much and feel like we are ready to push forward somehow together. And I wanna thank uh, Pamela for the uh, uh, introduction because it really highlighted for me how truly diverse a group we are um, and that we can come together around human rights is really awesome. Hello, thank you for showing uh, a great leadership over here and the fact that even though we are all different, but we have the same passion and the same zeal to make this town a better town with all these topics that are coming. Actually, there are so many complexities over here, and and but I'm very positive that we will go through that and uh, make a difference in this community. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so um, I would say I love all the committees that I work with, but I really enjoy the work of this committee. And um, it was, I think you have great leadership. Um, last year, this committee was phenomenal in setting goals and moving towards those objectives. And, um, and I can uh, anticipate that this year will be the same. So at a time when we're always meeting in Zoom, I think it was really great for this group to meet together in person. I think it um, fosters, you know, deeper relationships and connections. And I look forward to the work that will be done in 2023-2024. Also for the next agenda, I forgot, as um, a calendar of events, we need to take a look at what we're going, what if, uh, cultural events and or other events we're going to be dealing with in the next nine months.
October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, nine months. Okay. All right. So then uh, it is, what time is it? 3.54. At 3.54, we hereby adjourn the retreat of the Human Rights Commission. Thanks, everyone, for being here. <laughs>